Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thunder, thanks and welcome to the 2080 Thrillercast Lockdown Tapes. I am your host as always, Malchar, and on this episode we're talking to artist Colin Wilson. Now anybody who knows their Judge Dredd or Rogue Trooper will know about Colin's artwork. He brought a real European flavour to uh, to the prog in uh, the early 80s before going on to work on the iconic Blueberry, which is one of those European characters that never really kind of penetrated the, the British consciousness, but uh, was uh, nonetheless incredibly popular on the continent. So uh, it was great to be able to reconnect with him. I interviewed him 11 years ago for the Judge Dredd magazine. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, an absolute pleasure to be able to chat again. He is in uh, Melbourne in Australia uh, so uh, not only was it uh, quite late over there but uh, there's a, ever so slight delay on the uh, on the chat so apologies if that gets a little bit distracting I'm going to save the sales talk until after this interview so uh, sit back relax and enjoy chatting away to Colin Wilson well thank you for this it's great to reconnect after like I said 11 years <laughs> it has been a while, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for us, it's kind of going over all ground because we've, we've already talked about your, your your career for the magazine, oh, but... but... It was 11 years ago, so... Uh, yeah, that's true. Stories. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember Excellent. it was actually one of the first um, the first interviews I ever opened up because it was in English. Uh, that I actually talked a little bit about the situation we were in in, in London at the time. Uh, Janet and I uh, were... Um, in a very peculiar situation, but I'd never wanted to talk about it because I thought I'd get into trouble when uh, closer to the date. Whereas now it's like 40 years, 35 years later, so it doesn't matter. But uh, well, normally I, I don't talk about that kind of stuff in, in interviews. Well, I, I mean, that's the perfect point to start, really, isn't it? Because <laughs> um, you uh, you shouldn't have been here, you naughty boy. Um, tell yeah, us a well, little bit a, how you ended uh, up here. Uh, everyone likes tourists, uh, but yeah, I hadn't quite realised how complicated it would be to stretch it out a little bit. But uh, yeah, I arrived as a tourist and had, you know, no return ticket at all, which I thought they were going to ask me at the airport. But uh, I had um, I had a little, little bit of funds that I could have saved myself if I had, a, had been ordered back to New Zealand straight away. But uh, I took an immediate like to the place and, and never went back to New Zealand for 17 years. But the uh, first couple of which I spent in London and had a great time. Because you, you you'd been um, uh, you've been backpacking around Europe, hadn't you? No, I went to London oh, directly um, as uh, a, as a holiday. Um, originally, I was going to be coming back and maybe starting life again in Australia because um, I decided that I'd seen enough of New Zealand that I'd had a really good time in three of the ma major cities anyway over the years of of growing up and and earning a profession. But I was going to go to to um to london maybe spend a month or two if i could uh well as long as i could afford to and then come back to australia and maybe start life as a as a something maybe a, a commercial artist again like i had been in new zealand uh but i suddenly discovered when i got to london and through a lucky set of circumstances discovered that i could actually get paid to draw comics um, which i'd always done for free because it was such a inconceivable concept to be able to be a comic professional in new zealand uh, I thought, well, uh, maybe I can hang on here and see if I can stretch this out because uh, it was it was something I never imagined could happen, and it was it started off so easily that uh, I thought, right, I'm, I want to stay in this place. So we we fought long and hard to to stay in Europe. I I remember uh, that wonderful image of you uh, scribbling away. I, th I think you you you'd sent your wife out to to be a. Um... A, a typist was it was she yeah yeah or a, a pax uh, phone operation usually was the jobs that she got in in london near yeah, temping she was allowed to work i wasn't i was i was 30 so um she was under 28 so she would have only been 21 at that in those in those days uh so she was allowed to do temp work for a, a certain limited amount of time i can't remember what it was but uh um I was never allowed to work. I was strictly a tourist at, at 30 years of age. Uh, so everything had to be done fairly under the cover and hope like hell that we didn't get into trouble. We had a couple of close scrapes and uh, uh, it's a long complicated story of getting married to someone else and still not being allowed to stay there. And it, um, it was quite an adventure. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I, we had a we had a friend of you uh, um, uh, scribbling away in uh, in your. I, 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 were you squatting at the time? And yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, originally I was staying is staying in the spare room of some absent friend of a friend, like everyone does coming from this part of the world. Uh, and I managed to stretch that out for maybe six months. But um, then I, I'd got to know via friends that were living, um, other friends that were living in London, that I could maybe get a, invited to join this co-op. And they kind of were semi-official squats. They weren't, we didn't have any rights, but they, uh, it was, we paid rent, kind of. I paid five quid a week, I think. Um, uh, and we, it, we, maintained the state of the building in, in a way uh, and there were there were several there were probably 20 or 30 people in the co-op and, uh, and I got invited in and finished up by um, being allowed to have a little room in um, in Holborn of all places there were 12 of us in the in the house um, 11 Irishmen and myself <laughs> and I got the room with the collapsed ceiling so I went out and bought a, a parachute and strung up from the roofs to keep the powder off the floor and we cleaned it up and it was it was it was such an adventure but I could never do it again there, there was an outside toilet the the bath was on a landing on the first floor going up the stairs completely open to anyone coming in and out of the house and there were dogs and it was just appalling but it was uh it was just kind of fun because you know it was such an adventure I mean, you, you say appalling, but you're, you're painting such a romantic picture. <laughs> oh, well, it was, it was, yeah, the first winter was a bit tough because it was actually quite a hard winter as well. But uh, um, yeah, we, I got shown how to reverse the wiring on the electrical meter so that we could run it backwards for 12 days of the 30 days of the month. And, and uh, that kind of stuff was just great. And it was right at the time of the Brixton riots as well, which was um, pretty exciting time to be in London. Because uh, suddenly from being in quiet old New Zealand for 30 years, I, this is where the news came from. You know, the, the, the Brixton riots were going along over the other side of the river and uh, uh, Prince Philip got married. And uh, that kind of, and there was a balloon, big blimp dirigible flying over the city with advertising on it and all shining lights and stuff. It was just spectacular. It was a great year to be there. First year of Thatcher's reign and uh, coming from the outside the UK, that, that was a, a, an eye opener as well because uh, politically it was, uh, we got started doing demos and that kind of stuff because uh, my wife's a lot more political than I am. And so we were, we were out on the streets marching against all sorts of weird stuff. Uh, during that year as well so it was great it was an eye-opener and always with the threat of uh, uh, an immigration fist hammering on the front door to send you back yeah, to that, uh, and that happened uh, as well yeah well luckily it wasn't for me we had a um we had a friend come and stay with us or we actually were, were, had a phone call a friend of janet's arrived with some dreams of wanting to marry david bowie um and she was and and the the immigration people locked her up at the airport and we had to go and get her out and we were, she was allowed to stay with us for a week before she left got deported back to New Zealand and of course we looked after her for a week and then she did a runner and um and then they, they were coming around um knocking on the door looking for her um and so I had to be absent so I used to hide on the roof um while the, Janet talked to these very you know the good cop and the bad cop routine from these immigration people about where the woman was and unfortunately they turned up one day and she answered, she was visiting us and she answered the door um, before Janet could stop her. And they just saw her at the door and knew who she was and they just grabbed her and she was straight out to the airport and sent back to New Zealand. On the, uh, and um, I suddenly realized that I had to be pretty damn careful or the same thing would have happened to me. So we got, I got married to someone. So it was, um, they, were, they delayed it for another six months, but uh, we were complete amateurs and, and Croydon, immigration authorities made very short work of us <laughs> and my lawyer who I'd managed to be able to afford thanks to 2000 AD said yeah we can stretch it out a little bit but it's probably a good idea if you leave the country so eventually Janet and I moved to France. Let, let's let's take a step back and, and um, look at how you got to this point. Um, you, 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 <laughs> you're it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you, you, you're from New Zealand. Tell us a little bit about your background uh, in, in, in New Zealand and, and uh, how you came to be a, a, an artist, I guess. Yeah, sort of, I've always been involved with art in one way or another. I, I, I can remember being in high school when they, they, the when first year in high school, they kind of lined us all up in a line and said, art, metalwork, art, metalwork, art, metalwork. And I got in the metalwork one and just managed to get it changed back to being art, luckily, because that sounded like it wasn't particularly 
uh, minded in those days, 12 years old or something, uh, but uh, I didn't want to be skinning my knuckles in metalwork classes. So, um, I, and I just took to it. I really enjoyed high school art. And so I was kind of lucky because there was a kind of an art, art college very, very close to where I used to live with my parents. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll see if I can not go to university, I'll go to uh, art college. Uh, so even from that early age, I was involved in sort of media usually. And and uh, my interest in those days was photography as well. So um, I quickly discovered that I didn't really want to become an art teacher, which, which was what the art college were, were producing. I'd get a diploma of fine art, but expected to be an art teacher and that didn't interest me at all. So I kind of evolved into, working for a television company part-time and to become a full-time job and um i'd always been doing design work and paste up work and it was a great time because the 60s were so exciting with uh the kind of publications that i was aware of happening overseas so graphic design was something i was interested in and i did four or five years as a motorsport photographer and journalist as well because photography and motorsport have always been a passion of mine as well but eventually it was it was at the time when art production for commercial art and advertising was um, going through quite a revolution with um, the kind of way it was prepared. And uh, I eventually was pretty much doing that kind of work uh, in, uh, in the South Island of New Zealand uh, uh, and, and therefore got quite involved with production work as well. So one thing led to another and um, I, I started, um, I, I became a kind of, a, I moved to Auckland and became a, a, a kind of a partner in a, um, a friend's local newspaper that was being produced on uh, on an island where it was a sort of hippie community were on this island and he owned the newspaper and I used to go out and do go out on the ferry and do production work put the thing together for him basically uh, but he was he was involved in fandom for science fiction which was one of the things that I was first contact made contact with him about and I suddenly discovered that fanzines were quite an interesting thing to do and I did a lot of work for his science fiction fanzine because it was what I was reading at the time but then I suddenly discovered that comics was something I was interested in maybe I could do a, a fanzine myself and uh, I produced a, a fanzine for a couple of years set it all over the world spent a lot of money on it assembled it on the kitchen table just it was just a good way of getting in contact with other people in Auckland but also a few people around the world uh, um, uh, because fandom was quite a new concept to me and it was a great way to get to know people and I just used to send people bits of artwork and things like that um, with because I was producing work for myself and just doing it for fun um, and strips became kind of well known in New Zealand I was getting commercial work as well because advertising agencies occasionally would want something done in a kind of comic style and so I'd be the go-to guy um, to do that in New Zealand and I could save up a bit of money and started producing comic work uh, slightly more professional but um, I got a I got, uh, I was in contact with a guy called Martin Ashwood or Elf, Elf, uh, Elf in a UK fanzine called BEM, BEM. And um, I did some work, some covers for, 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 for that. And uh, he said, well, if you ever get over this way, you know, look me up, but also look up these people. And one of them was Brian Boland. And um, uh, it turned out that the, the squat that I was living in when I was in London was only probably 500 yards away from where Brian Boland used to live. So I went knocking on his door and um, showed him some of my work. And we, we had a lot of, it was funny hearing the interview with him the other day uh, um, that you did with him a couple of weeks ago. It was great because it really revived those kind of old memories of my time in, in London and spending a lot of time with Brian. But he kind of pretty quickly dragged me across to 2000 AD and said to, to um, to Steve, uh, the editor at the time, um, Thug, uh, to um, to give me some work, and they they gave me some work uh, eventually, and um, and then it became regular. So suddenly I was earning a living there, and very much determined then to stick on, stay on as much as I could in that part of the world. And really, that was my apprenticeship, uh, because the work I'd done before was up until that stage was probably pretty amateurish and just for fun. Whereas suddenly you know, thrown in the deep end. Here was this exciting magazine called 2018, which I'd never seen before in New Zealand. Uh, um, and uh, and it was just such a challenge to, to and, it, and it was a real honor to actually understand that I was up to the grade and they'd occasionally give me work to do and pay me an awful lot of money in those days. For me, that was, uh, that was a great way of um, making things happen. Because at one stage I probably had 10 good to my name, I suppose, in the squat. I mean, I had no way of, um, 
of earning the kind of money that 2000 ED were paying. So I was really excited to, to start doing regular work. Had you been into comics as a kid? Because you, you, you yes. said that, that you know, the, the, um, you hadn't really thought of it as a potential career by, that, uh, by the yeah, point you went yeah. out of college. Which, is, which I, I had been interested in comics, not, the, not so much American comics, although I kind of did grow up with the little, um, little editions of early 50s EC Mad Magazine, um, the Harvey Kurtzman kind of things I'd seen. But I was a, the things that I used to regularly read and really like well, for the art more than anything were um, the, the Fleetway War stories, Air Ace, uh, War Picture Library, those kind of things that I was starting to get to really understand the different guys were doing different types of stories. And of course, Eagle um, was, was something that I started to have a su subscription to at the time when um, Bellamy would have been doing Fraser of Africa. And it was just so exciting every week to get this one page of this masterpiece work that he was producing for that story in the early days of it. Uh, and then Heros after that. And so I was aware of those kind of things, but always with the kind of overlay that it was stuff that was done on the other side of the world that I'd never dream of being able to do myself. I, I used to sit there and admire the work and copy it and make up silly little comics of my own, but just purely as a, as a sideline, um, uh, uh, because the concept of being a, a, com a, a professional comic artist was just unimaginable. Um, it just didn't happen to people in New Zealand, as far as I knew at the time. Um, they had been, I discovered that there were professional New Zealand artists and some pretty well known ones, but certainly at that time, before I started doing strips, I had no idea that they existed at all. So um, arriving in London and discovering that I, I may be good enough to do that was a, was a huge step. Let's, let's talk a bit more about strips because um, uh, New Zealand, you know, it's, as big as it is, um, it's, it's a fairly small world yeah, very to, small world to, to be producing uh, uh, a, a fanzine which, which you know as you said gained uh, a bit of an international reputation um how exactly did, did did strips come about was it literally just you oh, i want to do this you start doing it and its reputation grew yeah pretty much so um the first couple of issues were pretty much just myself and uh, uh, producing the first one and, and also been introduced to a couple of other people who shared kind of similar interests to me other artists uh, which was remarkably lucky because the, 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 the their quality of work was extraordinarily high as well but they were doing commercial work usually as well and or animation work in the case of Joe Wiley um, but um, they were just doing comics once again for their for the for their own fun, and we started to share each other's work. And then I started to publish it in strips, and um, we got three or four really really talented people. So the standard of it was really high, and and the concept of having strips and editorial content and reviews and things uh, uh, as amateur as it was was kind of an unusual thing um, it, to because people weren't aware of fandom, I guess as well. Uh, and there, but I used to put together maybe. I think about 500 copies of it and they more or less were just sent out. I don't think I ever saw any return from a sale of strips in the whole two or three years that I was doing it, but it was, I'd produce an, uh, an issue when I had the time. I had some work to do. I had enough work to fill 20 or 30 pages and um, uh, put it together or get it printed free because it was part, it was part of the deal with, um, with Brian on Waiheke Island that um, he, he would, he and I would both print it together at the same time as he was printing his fanzine. We used to handle assemble it on the kitchen table. And well, I used to, because everyone else used to be very absent that weekend. Uh, so I'd put together 500 copies of it with a hand stapler and, and you'd just send them, send them to shops and in, in New Zealand, uh, in Australia, uh, get to know more people, send them overseas. I used to send a few to Bud Plant in the States and uh, obviously sent some to various people in places in the, in the UK as well. So it was just a way of, doing something producing something that was fun to do and um i had no idea that it would actually turn into anything uh and it it, it I, did, I think i did 10 issues uh, of it and then when i left to go on holiday to the uk uh i more or less just said to guys that wanted to okay you guys can take it over and i went on for another 12 issues i think as well over the next couple of years and there was a lot of people remember it fondly because it also was probably their first semi-professionally published work as well um, so it's turned out to be turned out discovered quite a network of, of contacts uh, of people that went on to do really interesting things and people look back on it now as being quite significant because I guess there was nothing else like that at the time um, certainly nothing I knew of and uh, um, uh, it was 
therefore sort of stood out. There's so many people uh, um, said, oh, I remember strips uh, when I first saw it. That's what got me inspired to, to do co more comic work. And of course, New Zealand now, because of the movie industry and Weta and everything is quite a little hub of very creative people. Uh, um, so I kind of got in really early on that. It was quite handy. <laughs> What sort of content? I mean, you, you mentioned the, the reviews and things like that, but in terms of the, 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 the comic content, you know, you, you, mm. you described um, a moment ago as, as, as your stuff being uh, amateurish, but clearly there was a, uh, a level there that you were achieving that people wanted to read. Uh, who knows? <laughs> they seem to, I, don't, I, don't, I certainly don't know how many people bought it, but certainly a lot of people saw it and, and had a copy of it, one more, copy of strips one way or another. But it was pretty self-indulgent stuff. Um, just because we were doing it all for fun. So I was doing kind of weird kind of sub Bellamy sword and sorcery stuff. And midway through my run on, on uh, over those years, I discovered European comics and suddenly I just did a complete swerve um, away from, from that influence and, went and magnetically stuck on the Moebius uh, Jean Giraud Europeans uh, approach to comics and started to learn as much of that, about that as I could. But um, it's, it's yeah, a couple of the things were, pretty much fanboy kind of stuff. There were a couple of good graphic artists. There was one New Zealand artist called um, uh, Barry, uh, Barry Linton, um, who was, was doing work that was just so typically New Zealand and of such a high standard um, that we just were really privileged to actually be able to provide him with an outlet of stuff. Because once again, he was just producing this work for his own enjoyment and um, and carried on effectively until he died a couple of years ago. He apparently had mountains and mountains of things. Never see, never saw publication in his lifetime, but uh, it was just beautiful kind of work. Uh, and so it was amazing to see what he just, that we were all kind of more or less based in Auckland at the time. And so we'd meet up at each other's places or at parties and things and he'd, uh, I'd see the next six or eight pages and he said, yeah, use this in the next issue. And it was always a revelation to see just work that was so diverse in its, in its approach. And, um, and so, and, and yet so, so uh, yeah, professionally done. I could, I would say that it was, yeah, it, it wasn't definitely, it wasn't all that pr professionally printed and produced in the magazine, but it was, it was just work that existed. And it was perfectly formed and uh, had an identity of its own, uh, which you don't, you don't normally get in fandom. Uh, you know, you're, you're usually like myself, you know, a wannabe artist, but without any serious imagination of being able to become professional people. Uh, whereas that these other these people were doing professional work and yet were not interested in becoming professional comic artists because either that, that was they were just doing it for their own interest or they were working in commercial work or animation. Uh, so it was, Turned out to be a variety of different styles and a great opportunity for newcomers to, to kind of, kind of try out, it's because it's always a big adventure seeing something of your own in print in, in actual printed material. Um, at at the time, it was um, probably the only ways people could actually see see their work being published anywhere. You had such a variety of jobs um, at, at this stage in life. After you'd come out of art college, um, I think you were doing maps, caption cards for TV. You worked in yeah. a bookshop. Yeah. You, you mentioned the, <laughs> the stuff about the, the motor journalism. Um, it was the seventies. So it was, that was those of the days. It, um, it was pretty easy to be able to pick and choose. Uh, uh, and I kind of just evolved through to just trying to do things that I was enjoy doing at the time. So it, it was lovely because you got to, under, I eventually got to learn the whole, process of printing and uh, camera ready copy and that kind of paste up work and design work and I'd always been interested in magazines and media from overseas uh, uh, through the 70s going through that whole revolution of um, uh, the modernization of magazine production was, was fantastic there were, there were things that I used to have subscriptions to like twin because I was interested in photography as well there was um, you know there's a magazine coming out of Germany called Twin with some beautiful photography, Sam Haskins work, all the photographers in those period, um, the guys in the States doing uh, Avant Garde, uh, a wonderful magazine for, they never lasted very long, but they were famous people. Milton Glasser was doing all the new typefaces and letter set and stuff. So the whole design world was going through such an evolution. And I was lucky enough to kind of ride that way because um, it was very easy to produce work that looked so much better than people that had been used to working with cold type and old fashioned ways of producing stuff. Offset printing was became so cheap that you could actually do much more interesting visual layouts and things. So I just was involved in media and 
found that I could work as a photographer for a while, a journalist for a while with motorsport. Um, Things only ever lasted two or three years, but it was a great way to actually pick up more skills for the toolbox. Uh, you came to the UK, as you say, as a tourist. Um, <laughs> was this was this the kind of usual kind of Kiwi diaspora that, you know, you, you, there's always that motivation to, to go out and travel? Yeah, pretty much so, because all my friends had left as well um, uh, in, uh, in New Zealand. I was one of the last of, of my group of contacts that actually went overseas because everyone, if you wanted to try out something that was sort of serious and slightly different, then you had to go overseas. So the, the big OS tour was a major part of, of everyone's uh, upbringing. And most people did it in their early 20s because also it was the start of cheap flights. Uh, uh, so um, getting getting to mainly to to the UK was a, a major step um, that everyone kind of took at, one, at some stage or other. And I was one of the last ones to actually do it um, because basically I was self-employed from the early 20s after leaving the, the TV company. Uh, so I was never really very flush as far as funds go. It was always um, having to work and not being able to save much money and, you know, pretty much, you know, spending money on rock and roll and, and, and good drugs and uh, the kind of stuff that everyone gets through in their twenties. And um, uh, so I was not, I've never been a big planner for the future at all. So I've just more or less sort of ridden whatever wave comes along. And um, so I was one of the last ones to leave. And so it was quite good because I already had people I could contact in London and say, Hey, can I sleep on your couch for a week or two while I book, you know, land on my feet. And it, it, one thing led to another like that. It was great. It's the kind of thing that would frighten the hell out of me nowadays, but uh, certainly when you're 20 years old, or in my case, late twenties. Uh, um, and, and it was an exciting thing to do because um, Growing up in New Zealand, you're always under the impression that all the news and all the exciting stuff happened around the world and little old stayed New Zealand was like a little old small Britain and quiet and very conservative and uh, nothing, you couldn't do anything out of the ordinary there and I didn't want to be ordinary. Uh, uh, ordinary was boring, basically. I thought I've oh, got, to, got to ride the edges a little bit and, and, um, and do stuff that's more interesting and it was it's the 60s after all. I mean, you look back on it now and I think how lucky I was. To, that was my teenage years in the 60s uh, um, with rock and roll and all the kind of social changes that were going on. I was just on that bubble bubble to actually get in, involved in the, so many things because my older brother effectively was a, five years older than I was and he became a mirror image of my father who was an engineer. He did the mechanical kind of stuff. Um, uh, whereas I was suddenly, you know, I was always told that there's no living to be made out of art. You can't do anything about art. And I kind of found that there was in a way and, uh, and doing many different kind of things was just handy. Let's explore a little bit this, this, this leap into drawing comics, because you, you, you've made it to the UK, you've become aware that, you know, that, that you can do comics. Um, what was it that made you finally make the leap? Was was it just something you were noodling away at, and it, you know the and Boland came along and uh, that? Well, watching watching Brian Boland draw Judge Judge Death, uh, some of those famous pages. Actually, I saw him do, uh, working, and I was standing beside him, annoying him, <laughs> talking about mostly films and other other things at the time. But uh, uh, looking at that and thinking holy hell this is this is good stuff um this is fun I, I, this is my kind of world um that kind of a kind of classic attitudes of 2000 ad i really enjoyed and especially when britain was so conservative at the time socially it was 2000 ad was really kicking kicking that kicking ass i suppose the best way to, to to put it and uh and to actually um uh realize that if i really worked hard I could at least get something published. And then it was very much one thing led to another. One job led to another. The first time, the first job that came up was, a, funnily enough, I was straight into doing a dread, um, uh, which was someone, someone had got sick or for some reason and they couldn't do a, a 10 page dread story for a, a summer special that 2000 were producing. So um, they said whether, could I do 10 pages in two weeks? And I had no idea whether I could at all. I said, yeah. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I jumped at the chance and um, little did I realize it was very few people who ever went straight into Judge Dredd when they worked for 2000 AD because for the next six months after that I was doing future shocks and just sort of short stories like everyone else that did in, in those days to, to try it whether you were, whether you were reliable enough to, to be offered a regular gig. 
Um, so the, the very first work I did was that dread story, but it didn't come out until I'd started to appear in the weekly. Um, the weekly is much tighter deadlines. And um, so I, I started, I think, at about 206 or 207 ish, ish uh, prog 206 um, with um, some some future shocks and short stories and within the next few weeks or a few months I was doing uh, uh, crime files um, with dread and um, pretty much getting regular work because the, the sweet was, taste of justice which was that first that's the one. story you that's, did that, that, that appeared in the 81 it turned out to be special. a classic story I loved it I, Absolutely. I it, I just, it was a great story I can't even it wasn't credited to any of the name guys I think it's T.B. Grover um, so I don't know who actually who wrote it but um, I have my suspicions and uh, it, it was it was an ideal story to, to get a to get a first gig um, that I mean, really it's, well on, on, on the archive it's it's credited to alan grant and oh is can, it now credited okay yeah and you can you, yeah, well, you can sense. you can kind of see that and it, it's just like i said it's one of those classic stories one of my favorites because it's that <laughs> it's, it's that world turned upside down style story you know yeah. where sugar is illegal it's kind of classic the, the, yeah yeah the kick on their last page um the the surprise twist was just beautifully handled i mean it's the kind of stuff it's bread and butter work for those guys writing those stories uh but for me it was holy hell this is great um, and uh, and so it was a, a good, certainly a good story to get a, 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 a to get the thing moving. I mean, this this was you literally walking onto this, and by this point, by sort of 1980, 1981, um, Dredd was really getting into the, the stride of things. Um, yeah, your style certainly to me, as uh, you know, I didn't read them at the time because I, I wasn't very old. Um, <laughs> I read them later in collection. Uh, your style seems to just appear fully formed. You know, it, 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 you kind of come in and it's like, that's the Colin Wilson style. But I yeah. guess from your perspective, that, that was not the case. No, not at all. No, I mean, you, you, you're completely unaware of that kind of thing because all I ever see even nowadays is all my influences. So much Brian Boland and those first stories. Um, and, uh, and of course, the Moebius thing, um, the, the European comic sensibility is there as well with um, much more of a fluid kind of texturally kind of thing uh, that I hadn't, and all of all the tropes from from that I'd stolen from Bellamy five years earlier were all kind of long since gone by that stage, and so it was pretty easy fitting in with the kind of um, that kind of the science fiction feel for the story because of being a science fiction fan and also being a suddenly being exposed to all the kind of books that I could get while I was in London. Um, the, the 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 you know the the kind of what are they called the publishing stuff of Star Wars and things all the the background drawings and all the preparation stuff and suddenly realizing that these they had these really talented artists that had designed all that kind of work um as i was saving up my money and buying the occasional book that i could afford to get of that kind of thing as well because those kind of books were not available to anyone in new zealand i think in those days or maybe they would have been a year or two later but um so was, the influences were, all, were kind of all there but i can just that's all i see is is it, in that work now i mean it and and of course the mistakes you know the stupid drawings that should have been redone um that you that just that's all you see with your own work basically and uh um it looks pretty damn primitive to me now but um i i had no idea whether it would work for for thug but it um it obviously filled a gap and the fact that i managed to deliver the st first story on deadline i suppose was handy um and i kind of learned my lesson pretty good too because brian was just starting to get into into problems with having a reputation of being a very slow artist and and I thought I can't afford to do that myself because I don't have an iota of his creative talent so I can't get away with that shit <laughs> I need to actually grind it out and um and make damn sure that I don't um create problems for the for the editorial side of it because it was still pretty much a shoestring operation um 2080 in those days and none of us dreamed that it would be going a year later that uh and it'd been going two years at that stage um, and, I, and I was there for probably a couple of years and it just was very much hand to mouth even then pretty much a shoestring budget um, it was I think it was earning good money but the but IPC were funneling it all off the their other, other publications and a lot of things that I didn't find out about until later as well because um, uh, uh, I there was no kind of other than Brian and, and then with Dave and and Mike McMahon um, didn't get to meet too many other artists because the kind of Westminster Abbey kind of comic marts were finishing off, but the comic conventions hadn't yet kind of kicked in 
gear like they did four or five years later with uh, UCAC and, that, and those kind of things. Um, I didn't really encounter that until I was living in France, uh, comic conventions and that kind of thing. So it was actually quite hard to get to know people um, because um, the Friday night pub, notorious pub visits after after Friday's work um, hadn't yet kicked into gear, or at least I wasn't invited to them. I did I wasn't unaware of them at the time, and um, and so I used to luckily enough be able to just walk across the river with my artwork and just deliver it, uh, usually on a Friday, and I'd I'd try to time it to deliver it late morning. So maybe they'd ask me to stick around for have some lunch and. Um, someone might come in uh you know I, I never met john wagner but i met a few of the other guys and uh, i remember seeing steve Dillon across the office at one stage um and and you wouldn't no one bothered to introduce you you could expect them to kind of know every, who everyone was um so it was kind of just i was there just sponging that stuff up and and um um and also getting a free food, free food, which was kind of nice because I still didn't have an awful lot of money <laughs> for the first few months. But um, that kind of the social side of it started to really kick off just as I was leaving, basically, to go to live in Europe. Um, uh, although we did start to spend, I was obviously spending quite a lot of time to, with Rachel and Brian um, because they were, became good friends of Janet and myself. Um, and also Dave was just an eye opener. Dave Gibbons was just so fun to be around because he's just such an entertainer, and um, and we're still are very good friends uh, now. We've kind of tried to squire him into a, uh, a good meal or two and some good times while he comes out to Australia for conventions, and I occasionally come visit him when I'm in in the UK, uh, or else we run into these days we run into just about everyone at conventions. So even though I don't do very American conventions, that a few of these guys now get invited over to Europe as well. So when I'm in there doing conventions, it's a great chance to sort of catch up with people. But in those days, where you're very much just working by your own. Uh, I never got to meet the writer of uh, Jerry Finley Day. Um, I think I might have talked to Cam Kennedy once on the phone, maybe. Uh, you just didn't meet people um, because everyone was just dispersed and working their own little their own little hovels, basically, or in my case, anyway. <laughs> um, I think probably some of the people probably had nice little studios and things, but that was a that was a long time before that was a, a, a my reality. Um, I was when, pretty when, much. When, just... when do you say? Um... You know, you were able to stand there and watch Brian Bolland as he as he worked on something like Judge Death. I, I hear a, you know thousands of voices cry out in pain that uh, you know <laughs> what what an incredible thing. What what was what was Brian like at the time? Because it was fascinating to chat to him um, on the on the podcast a, a little while ago. Um, what what was he like at the time? And and you, you kind of you said you know you were stood there bothering him or, or, or chatting away, but for, to 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 be able to stand there and actually watch him i mean that must have been incredible well that, but, but you, you i could watch things evolve i mean when when i turn up i, I was very self-conscious about being too nerdy about asking him what kind of pens he's using and what kind of inks and all those stupid fanboy questions that you get asked um i didn't want to be a complete idiot and do that so so i was often we we're often talking and mostly about music and films um cinema was you know he's interested very much in cinema and our tastes are slightly different so we'd talk about tarkovsky films or something that i couldn't stand that he loved or or the replacement the uh, what's the band's name what's those guys with the big eyes um that were, were yeah, I can't remember. They, they had they they never appeared live. They appeared live on stage, but you never knew who they were because their the heads were just one big eye. The residents or the replacements or something. I can't remember the name, but he he, he used to like really really obscure stuff. That um, whereas I was more of a straightforward kind of rock and roll guy. But we used to talk about all those kind of things. And of course, when you start talking like that, he's not working. <laughs> so you don't see an awful lot of it evolve. And, you know, you'd come back a day later, and that, that famous Judge Dredd gaze into the face of death panel uh, or the, the the page the half page that it was on um i remember seeing that evolve and thinking holy hell you know what am i up against here because that was just the golden era for him um that 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 period um the the three judges and um and pretty much creating hershey and the different characters um that he became so long or so later and then also it evolved through into him me being obsessed with European comics. So I, I was spouting on about how uh, exciting European comics were, which left Brian completely cold because like everyone growing up in the UK, they all wanted to work for the States and then they were just also being headhunted to go and work in the States. So it was interesting to see him starting work on Camelot 3000 and uh, that kind of work and, and um, 
Dave had uh, Watchmen in his future fairly soon after that as well. So it was, it was a, they were going through big changes as well. But we, but comic people often just don't talk about comics when we're together. Um, strangely enough, we usually talk about media stuff. And um, uh, so I didn't want to be too boring by trying to sit there and you know ask him where he gets his ideas from. This sort of bullshit, you know. I, I could have quite easily put my foot in it, when, but I, without knowing it. So I, had, I wanted to be careful because I kind of respected that this was a real privilege to be to be able to sit down and talk about stuff with the guy who was doing some of his best work um, or certainly his best work to that time and uh and and also the, f the fact that he'd been kind enough to take me over to the offices and um and give me a career effectively because it, it like i say he took you over to the offices uh were you doing um uh, sample pages were you trying out things or, or or was was it just stuff that you were showing brian that you'd just been noodling away at i I came uh, with a kind of uh, uh, some some they used to be called PMT some copies of some of my work um, that I just happened to put on my luggage when I came to samples. But I also started doing a little bit of kind of comic work um, just once again for for my own sake to actually um, to to keep the keep the hand in basically. Um, but that kind of wasn't really relevant at all to to much um, uh, of 2000 AD work, but. Uh, I must have shown them some samples of something. Um, I wasn't producing an awful lot of work because I, uh, I was existing on a shoestring and, um, you know, just trying to get a drawing desk and get materials and stuff was a, was a hard enough job until I actually started to get some return from the, those first few stories I did. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about Road Trooper because, um, you know personally that that's the strip that i most associate your work with you know i, I, I love your dread work but it's, it's the road trooper stuff um now that that had been going for a, a little while by that point jerry and and david uh had created it and there was a variety and, of and artists St steve and and um and the th or the three of them had uh done all the donkey work really um and i got invited on into participating with it fairly early on because i think uh, steve thug Steve McManus uh, had realized that Dave wasn't going to be able to produce six pages a week forever. Um, and he was hard at work on the first um, four or five episodes anyway at that stage. Um, and so I started to be given scripts so that after his, he would do the first six stories and then I did one or two. And then while he was getting a, involved in the, his next story arc. Um, so I'd got some photocopies of some of his early pages before they were in publication and said, oh, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, you know, go away and do your own thing with this. And uh, so pretty much Dave and I alternated maybe for the first six months, just the two of us, maybe slightly less time than that. Uh, it's hard to remember, but certainly that first collection um, is pretty much um, alternate stories, um, Dave and myself. Um, so it was great to kind of get it up to speed. And then Dave kind of, was losing interest in the in, in the story for one reason or another and I desperately needed to keep going with it because um, even though I sometimes was a little bit disappointed with the sort of lack of I wanted I was hoping there would be lots of good science fiction concepts and subtext going on and it was turning into a pretty much a, a, a more conventional kind of war story which was I was fine with as well because I grew up on war, Second World War stories, so I was still in my element as far as that goes. But it just seemed to miss the ball occasionally um, for for so compared to some of the exciting science fiction films that were being produced about that time. And and as for me, a story like Road Trooper had a lot of potential that to go in a lot of different directions. Uh, but for me, it was a good earner because it also gave me leverage to be able to get up enough money um, saved up to be able to to pack our bags and head over and stay in someone's flat in Paris, which he got the use of for the first few months um, as well. And also it gave me an opportunity to actually drag some of my artwork around um, to see some French publishers. Uh, they, of course, looked at, I think, sort of dread stuff or, or probably Road Trooper. And it was all in let. Um, it probably didn't even have any lettering on it because that still would have been handled by by Tom at the editorial office, and they were just completely baffled by this work. Um, they probably thought it was interesting, but had no idea what anything to do with Judge Dredd or 2000 AD was in France at that time. Uh, but it, it sort of looked probably professional enough that I actually got a leg on um, to um, to to get the possibility of getting work done in France, and um, and then that, that my 
my contact with 2080 tailed off fairly rapidly uh, when that started to appear. Um, the possibility there's, there's, started to appear. There's one element which uh, always appealed to me as, as, as a kid reading your stuff, and that, that's the way you depict future tech. Um, I, th I think it was Andy Diggle who said nobody does future tech like uh, like Colin Wilson. Um, <laughs> There's a few Europeans who do a lot more of it than I did at the time, but uh, it was a, it was prop. I, I come from a mechanical background, um, so mechanical stuff comes easy to me. I, you know, I was I've always um, had pottering around with motorcycles and cars and stuff, and it's got it runs in the family. So um, uh, that and my interest in science fiction as a as a reader. Um, for such a long time, uh, during the golden age for me of science fiction, the 60s and 70s, um, everything was being published in paperback. And so there was, I was just, that was all I was reading for probably a 10 year period, um, was just science fiction. Um, so seeing the work of obviously Moebius in Europe, but the, some of the European artists and suddenly realizing that uh, the Metal Hulon people um, were just using science fiction, science fiction visually in a way that was different as well as creatively, story-wise in a way that was different than what American people, uh, American artists and art and authors were doing. That um, I could I could probably absorb enough of that to bring that back into doing work on Judge Dredd and 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 especially Rogue Trooper because it was kind of easy. David done the donkey work. He he'd done all the heavy lifting with the series. It was all there. Um, I could just add a few little European little twists and. Um, disguise the fact that my drawing skills were nowhere near the match of Dave's <laughs> on the story. And, and uh, it was, it seemed to work. It was good. I, and, and those first, that first six months or first eight months of the, of my work on Trooper was really good because I just wanted to make damn sure that the story I was working on at that particular time was better than the story I delivered last week. And uh, the story I'll do next week will be better than the one I'm doing now. Uh, and I always wanted to have that drive to, to push it as, as far as I could and learn as much as I could because I mean basically I had a hell of a lot to learn, um, so it was um, it was it was an ideal vehicle for me and I was so lucky to have actually been asked to 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 be part of it. it, it Road Trooper for me is always very uh, fascinating in those early strips about that there feels like there's a kind of tug of war between its war influences and its science fiction influences mm -hmm. because. You know, uh, Jerry was well versed in in in, in writing war stories. You know, he'd, 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 he'd done an awful lot of work before this. Um, and when Dave uh, started the strip, it, it felt like a World War Two strip. You know, it felt that that, that was the conflict that was, that it was um, uh, referencing. But then with your work, it it felt more like something um, you'd see in the war photography from Vietnam. You know, with with the huh, remember, really? yeah, well, I remember the oh, the Marauders. Uh, um, uh, the 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 kind of helmets that they wore and the face gear that they wore and the the, the hoppers looked like um, uh, um, the Hueys um, that they well the, 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 the funnily enough Dave, Dave probably is responsible for a lot of that because he actually put me onto a um, a bookshop a, a military bookshop in Charing Cross and um, suddenly I could go in and get all this amazing uh, reference material that just sparked off ideas a lot of it was to do with Vietnam as well but um, uh, the, the the kind of that's the basis of being able to extrapolate that a little bit further into the future and and uh, make it look exciting. But also, I've always wanted science fiction to be grubby because the future's the future's not happy. You know, we're living it now. <laughs> um, it's um the future science fiction shouldn't be happy. Science fiction should have a subtext of the fact that life's going to be shit in the future. And I've always wanted it to be that feeling of it being menacing and dangerous and not very pleasant. So that that overlay worked well in Trooper as it does with Dread to a certain extent. Uh, Dread's leavened with a huge amount of humor, which was brilliant and so, so precious to be able to manage that. Um, whereas Trooper was very much just a grim, simple story. Uh, so you wanted to make it look as real and as grubby and as tough as it would have been in, in the same situation. Or well, I thought the same situation because yeah, science fiction shouldn't be clean, shiny. Um, it's uh, science fiction should be. You know, the the film I probably hated the worst of anything was um, I, because I didn't realize it was actually satire at the time. Was um, uh, oh god, what's it called? The film uh, Starship Troopers with the bugs. I thought that was terrible <laughs> as a film, uh, but um, because it was, they were, but it was actually the 
the Dutch director taking the piss out of the uh, of the idea of these spectacularly gorgeous looking people with these beautiful uniforms and these incredibly stupid naive 60s 50s um robert heinlein attitudes towards going and, and going fighting wars where whereas all that kind of stuff is a dirty business and and science fiction nowadays is once again with television especially has caught up with it very much so so suddenly science fiction's become visually very inventive but um very very um uh, it's a lot of subtext and 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 it's 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 showing you that you know science fiction is going to be like alien it's not going to be like star wars uh, because uh that, that that was the dichotomy back in those days and i was very much an alien person um as far as uh tastes go so i wanted to bring that kind of plus you can also with a with a multitude of overlays of stupid detail you can hide a huge amount of deficiencies in your own technique so it's the, the hardest thing in the world i think as, a, as an artist would, would be to draw a strip like herge's tintin because every line has to be absolutely perfect whereas i go the other way i i could bury bad drawings in a shitload of awful uh, grime basically and texture and 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 feel and and science fiction for me that works science fiction not the bad drawing but the but the ambience <laughs> I, I see an awful lot of of uh artists like uh like chris foss and and the the, the cover artists of the 1950s and 60s yeah. uh, on the on the sci-fi books because they they i'm going to come back to marauders because it's my it's my favorite story um the there's that that moment where the the, the hoppers are, are zooming out of this this kind of abandoned um uh base in 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 the swamp and it, that kind of <laughs> uh 50s and 60s artwork always made me feel about that that the, there was that grime there was a sense of living in the ruins of the future kind mm. of thing you know if you look over my shoulder i've got one of the yep. Stuart cowley books that that used all the um all the those old covers to kind of string a story together um do, do you think there's a, a fundamentally different attitude towards the future um between uh, America and, 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 and Europe? Do, do Europeans uh, see the, the future as not necessarily possibly, good thing? Possibly, certainly was in those days as far as comic art goes, but I don't know, I, it's hard to differentiate US to European as far as um, the actual writers go for, um, for fiction, because you had your, you your right-wing cranks like Heinlein doing Starship Troopers, but also you had your Philip K. Dicks where it was internal psychological science fiction. Um, so you had that, had that explosion of different approaches to science fiction from the, it, it wasn't the science fiction of the 50s, um, of analog and the kind of magazines in the 30s and 40s were. Um, it's a little bit like what happened with films, uh, I think uh, with Westerns especially. I mean, there's a lot of westerns now that don't age very well from the 50s because they're very very conventional and quite simple um, suddenly the 60s especially from the mid 60s onwards started to question things a lot more um, they weren't interested in valor and standing up for the right values it was more you know this is a shitty world and we've got to find some way of surviving and the science fiction as well i think was doing the same thing so the 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 that approach to the writing side of it definitely started to suggest wider frontiers for the artists as well. Uh, William Gibson came along with um, Cyberpunk, and I was thinking, this is perfect for comics. Uh, but it took a long time for that influence to to be to be seen in in science fiction comics. Um, but to a certain extent, there was all, all it was there all along with with 2080 with Judge Dredd. Um, that's why it was so good at, in those particular period because there was nothing else like it. Um, I couldn't imagine ever working for anyone else because I've I have long uh, been had a massive lack of interest in American comics. Um, I'm just not an American comic person for, it, for conventional. Uh, American comics because I want to see the satire or the or the sub strong subtext of of uh, European um, comic science fiction comics especially um, where things are much more gritty and and sinister and mean um, because like I said before the future's mean it's it's not here for us to enjoy it's uh, he, here to tell us that 
we've got to do the best we can now because it's going to get a hell of a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting what you were saying about um covering up what you see as deficiencies in your artwork with with a bit of grime or you know things like detail. that detail with detail because mm. my overriding uh reaction to your to your work particularly on rogue trooper was was how clean it felt you know the the, the lines were were bold they were consistent i mean was was this uh, how were you putting this artwork together? Was, was it brushwork? Was it was it pens? Was it dip pens? A uh, bit of everything. It's hard hard for me to tell nowadays until I look at some pages. But um, I think uh, the European thing made me discover brushes, uh, and then eventually with dip pens as well. But previously, I'd use rotring pens in the fine Frank Bellamy style, um, and uh, that's a kind of a for me, it's a kind of an artistic kind of dead end. It, it can be, it can serve well someone like Bellamy, who was a genius with his graphic skills. Um, but um, uh, sub Frank Bellamy is a bit of a dead end um, because it, it's not all that dynamic. It's beautiful to look at, but um, I wanted to be try to get a little bit more dynamic, but also uh, still be fairly realistic and hard edged and, cl and clean in that sense. Um, uh, and then, of course, Obviously, someone like Brian had a huge influence on me as well because he'd have to be the most, the cleanest, perfect line kind of guy uh, around at the time that I'd ever seen. Uh, so that had a massive influence on me as well. And it was only until a little bit late that I could understand and really enjoy um, someone like Mike McMahon um, with work on Block Wars and that kind of stuff um, with the Bigfoot kind of style, but the heavily textured work that he used to do in those days. Um, I didn't really kind of get at the time and i only appreciate them now um appreciate the kind of creativity that went into them and, and the inventiveness that was, is there um it's a just i guess it's my particular um feel for art and and design uh that um that that kept it kind of clean but it's funny because it's very difficult for me to say in so many ways because um it's the kind of difference between european and american comics as well for a long time and for american comics i was looked upon as being too european and for european comics i'm often looked at as being too american so it's kind of hard for me to tell exactly where it sits you know it's um it's pretty much what just gets finished and gets out the door and um and then i look at it a year or two later and suddenly think oh i should have spent more time on that <laughs> We, we, we'll move on to, to talking about your work on uh, European comics in a moment, but I just want to just dwell on on your time in 2080, which was relatively short. It was only a, a couple of years um, uh, in the 80s. What did that period do? Obviously, it established, it established you as a, a, a comic book artist, but, but for you, for your style, for your work, for your ambitions, what did your time at 2080 uh, achieve from your perspective? Oh, it's a, it was a hothouse of apprenticeship. Um, I started being a complete amateur and um, after a couple of years of having regularly published work, I could start to realize that uh, I could get a lot better at this. I really should be getting a lot better at it because um, that this is an opportunity that, you know, is, is I'm not going to let this one go, go back to the keeper. Um, so it, it was an amazing hothouse of improvement because it was, I was just immersed in all this, uh, these all these influences of all the material that was available in Europe that I was wasn't aware of living in New Zealand. So the the the, the kind of I could just soak up influences and and it just spurred me on to do better myself in a way. So it was a it was that kind of um, arc of um, hopefully improvement um, to um, to just get better at what I am. Because once again I was I thought well oh, this is great getting work for 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 the UK and it seems like I can get regular work for 2000 AD, but is it good enough to make the, across the channel and, um, and go up against the really serious big hitters in Europe. Um, and, it, and without those 2000 AD years, uh, th there'd be no way that I could have um, got a foothold in Europe. It was, it was a fantastic apprenticeship that, that, that was a, a hothouse of, of, of improvement hopefully hopefully it's visible it certainly was to me as, and as far as confidence goes as well because uh, i had absolutely no confidence or ambitions at all when i first started out it was um uh i, I very much a sort of forelock tugging you know colonial coming to the to the big world and going gee am i can I, do you think i could be possibly good enough so you've got to got to get those kind of corners knocked off you because um 
I never wanted to become like Americans who all think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, you know, they're very good at selling themselves. I've never been very good at selling myself and haven't really, I've been incredibly lucky. Um, but I also understand that you've got to be in the right place at the right time to be lucky. Um, so you, you, it's positioning. You've got, you've got to work hard to be available and to be seen to be available and, and, and of some worth to an editor or, or, or whatever. Um, so you, you just, you work for yourself, but you just make damn sure that it's as good as possibly can be so that it might be noticed by someone else. And if it just happens that people want to read the, that work as well at the same time, uh, it's all the better. Your uh, career path is unusual because at this, <laughs> at this point in time, as you've referenced, everybody else was looking to America. You know, you had the British invasion of the 1980s. You had um, uh, DC literally coming over and, and waving checkbooks at people and saying, you know, you, you can do whatever you I want. I was very lucky I missed that period. That was just after I'd left. But uh, yeah, the fishing trips by Dick Giordano and those people were just happening in the mid 80s. Or the, I left in 82 or 83. 82 to go to, to France. And that was just starting uh, the conventions and things. and and all those guys dreamed of working for American comics. So it was a perfect marriage. Um, and, um, and some of them did some reasonable work in the end, didn't they? <laughs> from, from, from that, from that epoch. Yeah, that was okay. Um, but my, my eyes, my eyes were always fixed on Europe and, um, and, and also just going over and finding out whether it was possible. And if it wasn't, well, I'd, you know, uh, I'd, I'd go back to, to, to probably Australia or, because I I wasn't probably going to be allowed to get back to UK, the UK, um, maybe I could. Well, I couldn't work from Australia in those days. Um, but um, do you, do you think things would have? Well, how how do you think things would have turned out differently if you'd stuck around for another six months or a year? Oh, um, it's hard to tell. Um, I would have been back in New Zealand because the immigration authorities would have got me. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> As it was, I still had another three years of trying to crack it in Europe. So uh, uh, before I got completely legal, uh, but uh, um, it was it, it, it wasn't in, 2008. wasn't an end to a means in the in a career sense. It was a fantastic opportunity in a technical sense to actually improve my skills. And um, and if that was if that if that was what what I had wanted, I would have done 2000 AD work for years um, happily. I, I, I would have liked to have, I tried to avoid doing all the humorous rogue trooper stories because um, I, I, it just doesn't suit my temperament at all. Um, uh, and I'm not very good at humorous uh, because my, I've got a different sense of humor than that. <laughs> um, so they were coming in more and more as I was heading out, out the door in a lot of ways. Uh, but there would have been I would have probably would have really liked to have got involved in creating something with a writer um, like Dave had with Jerry and, and Steve on, on Road Trooper because Road Trooper was, it, although it became second only to dread in, at that particular period and it, that's exactly what it was designed to do. By, by 82, it was starting to become a little bit routine and, and, um, and I could see an opportunity opening up for something a little bit more dynamic with science fiction that subsequently came along in the 90s anyway um, um, with um, with the kind of different strips that 2008 started to run and it became changed the, it be, made Rogue Trooper look quite old-fashioned 10 years later uh, I would have liked to have hit head in that direction but um, it was very difficult to to be anything other than just an artist who delivered his work on time at 2080 at the time, because there were a lot of other people wanting to do their own thing as well. And the writers were such a high standard already that it would, I wasn't yet at the stage where I could actually sit down and talk about concepts and ideas with a writer um, anyway. So um, uh, that's one of the reasons why I probably wasn't planning on sticking around too long anyway. Um, uh, and and I wanted to get to Europe because in Europe I I was seeing the possibility of actually creating my own work or working with a writer and creating our own work, and then 
presenting that to a publisher, which was the fundamental difference in the in the two business models. Uh, um, Europe was much more author orientated, whereas um, you were part of a production line in, in 2000 AD, very much like what the situation was in the States as well at that time. You, you were invited on to work on certain characters, but you had very little creative input other than the particular thing that you were employed to do. And, uh, and, and unless you got to some heightened level um, in the production that you were actually had the freedom to actually take things in different directions, um, you were just very much part of a production line. And I thought that the comics, the best comics that I'd ever enjoyed probably hadn't been like that. Um, uh, and I saw that it was possibly because the authors had their freedom, their artistic freedom to produce their own work, uh, their own ideas. That was why there was such a quality difference for me anyway, a quality difference in the European production because um, uh, for me, there was a lot of exciting stuff appearing in the, in the, at that particular time in, in, the, in, the, in Europe um, that most probably people weren't aware of at all in the UK. Your shift to Europe was both uh, career-wise and physical, because you literally moved to yeah. uh, uh, to Paris. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you, you've already touched on uh, the reaction of French publishers saying that, that your work was a little bit too British, a little bit too American. <laughs> um, that that must have been quite dispiriting that you were falling directly well, I, between I, two stools. I didn't hear hear that till a little bit later, but I was completely unaware of the fact that I turned up in Europe at a time when the publishers were cash rich. It, it, since um, 68 and into the 70s, European comics had gone through a, some really big major changes. And, um, and by the late 70s, and then at the early 80s, the pub, new young upstart publishers that had started 10 years earlier were pretty well established and really wanting to branch out. And um, so they were prepared to take risks on projects that were new and exciting in a, in a way, and they were prepared to take risks with new talent that looked as if they might be able to do something um, uh, uh, for them to earn money off. And um, so it was a good time to turn up in Europe. And um, once again, it was a fairly steep learning curve getting to um, <laughs> to, to speak French. And um, Janet, Janet served me well by doing her hard studies and did all the talking for me in those days. But um, it was a good feeling in Europe, and I did once again. I had no idea of it at the time when I was there, but I realise now that it was a great time to to be. I was a lucky time to be there because um, uh, the whole comic business was really, really exploding. The sales figures were enormous, and um, publishers was pretty much starting all over the place, and uh, of a very, very high quality as well. And so um, I was lucky. 2008 is, is is known, particularly at this point in its history, of, of, for its uh, hyper-compressed storytelling. Did you have any difficulty adapting to the pacing uh, of, of, of European comics? And, and, and how, do they, how do they differ? Absolutely. Well, they differ fundamentally, uh, apart from the, the, the business model side of it, where it's, it's a very creator-driven. And um, the, the creators get together, produce something, some samples of something, and pitch it to a more like a film industry thing where they pitch it to publishers uh, um, and you also retain the IP which is um, another fundamental difference which is quite advantageous now um, in this day and age but um, yeah the the format really re I love the format it was exciting uh, hard covered books 54 pages 48 pages in those days of content no ads they were kind of you suddenly were an author. You weren't just a part of a production line. Um, and it meant that you could also could stretch out with storytelling, which is what I wanted to be involved with with science fiction because six page stories or, or two six page weekly episodes of, of Rogue Trooper to do a, a story arc is so compressed. Um, uh, it's, it's much more difficult to do, in fact, uh, to do well. But 2008 did, did it brilliantly. But it wasn't the only way uh, of doing comics. I didn't want to do 22 page American comics um, monthly. Uh, there was no way that I was physically capable of being able to do that anyway. Um, so uh, a book a year or maybe two books a year, 100 pages a year were seemingly possible to begin with, but to have books coming out like that, um, that I was effectively could be much more proud of being one of the creators of the book um, was something that really was an interesting 
artistic challenge um, to to um, to produce something, and and certainly the storytelling form was going to be difficult because also I'd never done very much writing of my own. Um, 2008 was so easy because it was all written for you and all I had to do was imagine the pictures. Um, so it was a big step in that sense. Um, I, it took me a little while to start to understand how it worked. Um, but then I first of all started doing a, a story in Europe um, that I did write myself and immediately ran into the French language problem. French English um, became a major problem because it was much more complicated translating something that I was writing in my English and uh, getting it translated by friends and 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 other people in into French uh, because it immediately was not French the way French looked at it anyway. So that was a, a I, I wanted to be as European as I possibly could. So I quickly realised that it was probably better to work with European writers um, uh, than actually to to produce work on my own. And plus the fact that it was such a challenge that why should I be fooling around? writing material and learning my trade as a writer when in actual fact what I'm probably better at is to actually just spend that much of the energy getting better at my at the artwork side of things and it's become a once again it becomes a well 2018 had never been a collaboration between a writer and artist anyway because the writers always work for the for the editor and the artists work for the editor and you never get to meet almost never get to meet um, uh, in those days whereas I had to meet people that I could show work to and then try to actually find out whether they were interested in doing something with me that we could therefore pitch to a um, to a, a, a publisher. Um, and that fairly rapidly became the better solution than for me trying to write stories um, and then going through all the difficulties of translating them. Your first uh, proper European work was, uh, and I'm not going to attempt the French because if your French <laughs> is bad, mine is absolutely non-existent. I've, I've failed German at school, so, you know... Oh, <laughs> I cannot yeah. be trusted on foreign languages, <laughs> um, but it's called it, in the it translates as in the shadows of the sun, and that was a three book kind of post apocalyptic science fiction series. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that evolved? Because you ended up, as you say, working with a, a French writer on that eventually. Yes, yeah, so eventually for the for the for the third book, um, it was much easier to to talk it over with the French writer, and and then he could go away and not write what I wanted, but actually involved some of the concepts that I'd already established in the first two books but it was just a really a, a a melting pot of so many ideas and things that interested me in science fiction at the time it was to do so it's a long time ago now so it's hard to remember all the details so it was actually the, technically the English title should be into the shadow of the sun not in the shadow of sun um, here we go sli <laughs> slightly more you. doom laden but in actual fact it, it's it actually means in the shadow of the sun um uh, in French, basically, uh, uh, but it just involves. I think setup was that there would be a a, bio, a, a a biological devastated Earth um, that had been semi abandoned by a, a ruling class that could afford to, and were living uh, on um, effectively large space stations, worlds orbiting Earth and elsewhere. Um, but there was a sort of subtext involved with the machinery that that created to do all the hard work for them as far as uh, um, uh, construction and things. Um, the robots had effectively, the, the androids had effectively become a subculture that had moved away because they were much more efficient at so many things um, than the corrupted upper class. Um, and so the, this world was, in, you were introduced to this world by the fact that the 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 orbital classes were farming human content that they needed of the people that were, uh, what are they called at the moment with the pandemic thing? The, um, uh, I can't remember the term, but the, um, the way that you, there's some people with, whenever there's a biological devastation, there are some people that are immune and can survive. Uh, they have a natural immunity. And so there's still people living in squalid conditions on earth um, and, and, it just begins with someone coming up out of a manhole cover and starting to explore the surface of earth because they've been living underground and then getting hijacked by the people coming down and farming them from the, from the space station. And then also therefore getting introduced to the, the robotic side of things and then realizing that we're more and more complications and worlds out there. Um, and by the end of the third book, we had actually got 
seriously influenced by William Gibson and, and the main it was three characters of the names of the three books. So the, the names of the three characters, the second one's Mantel when he dies at the end of the second book, because I was so pissed off with comics forever killing people off in them. Um, and, and then them reappearing again six months later, reborn as if nothing had ever happened. I, I wanted a situation where if someone dies in the comic, that's it, they're gone. <laughs> they're, they're actually, really, that's the end of the story for them. The third book is Alia, the woman, and she actually gets transmuted into a computer um, database uh, and almost entirely. So she ceases to become physical. She's entirely uh, an ele electronic thing, which is it's an extension of things from William Gibson and science fiction that some certain si science fiction that has very much impressed me because um, uh, it kind of opened up something which subsequently has become probably more interesting than it was to, pe to readers at the time. But it was very primitive in its storytelling and because it needed to be an adventure story as well. Um, uh, so it's, it's got lots of action and lots of interesting things for me to draw on it. And um, uh, it still has some kind of ideas in it that um, uh, to me had some worth um, because science fiction should have some worth like that. I think uh, it should have something to say. And hopefully it had some, some, some text like that that readers took out of it as well. Uh, but it was very much originally, only just, it was very much, I was asked to do a five book series to begin with by the publisher and I limited it to three because I had no idea if I could write three anyway um, um, and I only had the v vaguest outline of where the first book was going but with the opening of being able to extend it through to interesting things uh, in the subsequent years uh, and Terry Smolderin helped me write the third book and it turned out to be quite a bit different um, in content but in substance pretty much wanted what I wanted uh, in the story of the of the, the third character becoming non-physical basically um, becoming so, quite spiritual without being religious uh, with, with, with the series like this I mean you know we, we we're kind of using comics to, to, to the notion of original graphic novels you know big thick things lots of pages but it, it's a very different world in French comics isn't it uh, yeah you could say that <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> it's hard for me now because of being on the inside looking back out again. It certainly was a completely different world when I went back to doing Star Wars for, for, for the States for a short period of time because that was definitely the, 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 the science fiction that I'd left behind by going a, to a certain extent to Europe. Uh, but yeah, there's a much more organic, organic kind of... Um, Oh, it's hard for me to think of the words at the moment, but that, that, that kind of, it's the difference between, yeah, it's the difference between Heinland and, and Philip K. Dick um, or, or, or Star Wars versus Tarkovsky in a lot of ways, I guess. Um, uh, is it, science fiction is, a, is, a, is, is ideas, um, uh, not just a Western transfer, trans, um, transplanted into space. It can be, it can be that, and Star Wars has done that very well. Um, but it's not, it's, it's, it's missing a lot of, of what science fiction could be. I, I don't, I'm not sure about nowadays because I don't read any science fiction at all, but um, certainly in those days, the, the books were doing quite a lot of exciting things. Um, so you can have your big space operas like Dune, which are just so visually exciting that, that they can, could make interesting films and certainly could, that kind of thing could be done very well in comics as well. Maybe not to that scale, but um, I just wanted to get involved in tossing around ideas because I knew that I didn't, I was creating something that I didn't expect to be working on in five years time anyway. I just wanted something self-contained that I could get a foothold into European comics. And, and of course, that's what happened. Well, I, I mean, it's good to talk about Westerns because of course the, the, the thing that you did end up working <laughs> on was uh, Lieutenant Blueby, which, which is one of those characters who, who, I don't think has ever really made any kind of leap into into the British uh, comics no. consciousness. Well, it's more if if at all in America as well too, because um it's um uh it's it's exciting for non-Americans because it's a different take on it's a, bit, a little bit like the the Italian westerns in the in cinema. It's exciting, but um, Americans have got a very sort of precious feel for westerns and 
after the explosion of the of the movies in the 60s and 70s there's very very few westerns got made for quite a long time and, and western comics i think as well almost died out um, for a long time uh, because it, it, genres can get exhausted uh, and they need they need co a constant influx of creative influences from an exterior and there's a resistance to that in america with american genres as much as there is a resistance language wise for english language comics having ex ex importing influences and content from non-english um, language comic producers as well there's a there's, there's barriers there that the the, the uh, most people probably aren't aware of, but it's just because it's just effectively people don't read things that, uh, that, that I mean, they obviously are not interested in reading things that are not in their own language, but if it comes from elsewhere, uh, the sensibilities are often quite different than the, because genres can be e expansive, but they also can be a little bit too self-contained. Um, and I always feel that the genres are there to be uh exploded and with with new people um new influences uh, uh new approaches uh because genres are big enough um, judge dread is a genre you know 2008 or judge dread especially as a genre it demands input from so many different people with so many different styles of storytelling because it's big enough and strong enough to survive um and and blossom because of the huge amount of material that Judge Dredd has been uh, been involved with over the about forty odd years. Uh, it becomes a genre in, in itself, um, and and the Western for Americans doesn't really interest them when it's not handled by Americans themselves. And Americans were really burnt out, I think, on Western comics. I was wouldn't have been interested in doing a Western comic for an American market anyway. Um, whereas someone like um, Blueberry. I was certainly more interested in the graphic side of it, the, the actual artistic style of, of Moebius. Um, Jean Giraud was doing so many exciting things that was it was like a movie, but it was also for me very much like a an Italian movie, like uh, Sergio Leone take on on the West, um, which has has lasted for me much longer than most of the American westerns that were produced in the fifties or sixties and seventies. I'm actually going back and rediscovering the fifties stuff again because once upon a time I used to think that it was too conventional and um, too cliche ridden, but it was only cliche ridden because it was so good. It became cliched at the time. But um, there were directors like um, you know Anthony Mann and um, people doing really quite an interesting um, movies in the 50s that I only saw happen with someone like Sam Peckinpah in the 60s with The Wild Bunch, really exploding a genre with a whole lot of different a different vocabulary um, and renewing the whole genre of the Western. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, um, uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, later, um, but Sergio Leone for me did the most exciting western ever with Once Upon a Time in the West. I mean, it's one of my all-time favourite films, and I just watch it every few years again. It just uh, hasn't aged at all for me. There's still something you, to learn every time you see a film like that. You you you, you talk about regeneration because you you weren't working on the main Blueberry strip. You were working on the 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 kind of young blueberry uh, thing yeah. because I, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Jean Michel uh, Chalier and uh, Jean Giraud weren't getting on particularly well at the time, were they? No, they were okay. They were they they were getting on okay, but they weren't getting on with publishers. Um, the main problem between the two of them was that Jean was becoming very well known as Moebius, and especially in the states, and it was very much more personal work that he was interested in. Um, but he needed to come back in every few years and do a blueberry um, to earn the funding that he required to sustain his lifestyle, I think, basically. Um, and it was, and I certainly never told this at the time, but to, to revive uh, the early, the, the younger days of blueberry, La Jeunesse de Blueberry, was very much a commercial decision because there was a problem that Jean wasn't producing work fast enough or often enough more than anything. Uh, to have a blueberry every, even every two or three years it was often four years and also he was in the stage where he'd become involved with the religious sect and was in the process of moving them all to tahiti to live and and jean-michel charlier understood that this might be the end of his collaboration on blueberry and but we need product and they were they'd 
they'd just started a, a publication in Europe, which was entirely based, the whole publication, a weekly comic was published published around all of the stories, reuniting all the stories, series that, that Charlier had created and was currently working on, of which Blueberry was the, by far and away the most notable one, but there were there were many, many others. Um, and then suddenly if Blueberry was, the rug was pulled out from under Blueberry, the publisher was going to be in real trouble. So they came up with the idea of um, sort of reinventing. Giraud had done some little short stories 10 years earlier um, because there'd been a problem with Pilot and uh, and he knocked up some really quick stories which became collected as, as La Jeunesse um, books later. But um, they thought, well, maybe we could actually find someone else to, to work with Charlier and, and do La Jeunesse while Jean's otherwise occupied with his bizarre sect in Tahiti, which didn't last more than six months anyway. So, um, uh, but in the meantime, it, it meant that I could start work on um, on doing a book and they could test the waters to see whether Blueberry had legs being drawn by someone else because um, uh, quite clearly, uh, they, they, I wasn't going to be, uh, none of us could be another another Jean Giraud. Um, so it was very much a, a testing the temperature to see whether the fans would be interested enough to to um, to read some new La Jeunesse stories and it, and it worked out. Uh, man, of course, it was a big opportunity for me. I thought when I first got uh, asked to do it, I thought oh, this is going to be a great opportunity for um, I can work beside the the genius, the master. I can look over his shoulder and I'm going to ask him about what sort of paper he uses and where he gets his ideas from, even if it do does make me look like a complete idiot. But if he was that very week, he was in the process of moving to Tahiti, so I never saw him for the next year. Um, so I was pretty much on my own, which was a shame because. Um, I would have kind of like to have pumped them for information. <laughs> so the, the, the publishers, Glenna, um, had, had been pushing you for commitment to a, to a new series, hadn't they? Uh, not, no, not strictly. I think they realised that when Blueberry came along, I was a kind of lost cause to them um, uh, because um, uh, uh, that they were, obviously wasn't going to be seeing much work. They're actually very very timid about producing the third book uh, and in the end I said no no we want to do it we'll tidy it it'll be finished off in the third book and and they went ahead with it but I'd probably by that time I'd had the first Blueberry album uh, my, my first Blueberry album with uh, Charlier had come out and it was working for the public and they probably realized that it was a done deal and um, I wasn't going to be likely to be available for anything to do with Lena. Um, and effectively well, I resisted it a little bit. I was effectively asked not to do anything else by the publisher of Blueberry, just concentrate on Blueberry. Um, uh, and then effectively, I produced six books over a period of about five or six years and was really only limited by the production speed of, of Jean-Michel Chalier, who um, was writing so many stories as well as working for a television company at the time, traveling the world, uh, that um, Blueberry was being slowed down by his output as more than more than mine, um, and then also Jean started doing Blueberry again as well. Um, so that they had the had pretty much a book coming out each year, um, sometimes two a year. Um, after that, it, it, your style had been so influenced by Giraud's work. When you started on on Blueberry, was was it a, a perfect fit? Did you try and tack closer to to the kind of stuff he was doing, or, or were you trying to develop your own style on the strip? I well, I kind of didn't take much realization that they probably thought that I was like a little mini Giro, um, because my style, my to, my whole technique was was so much based on his work. Um, but I was I was scared stiff. Um, I had no idea how big blueberry was in europe i i knew about it i realized it, but i realized if it was only one of it's probably five or six different westerns let alone all the other two thousand books that came out every year in europe at that stage um so and i, I was concerned that it was going going to die a death with the with fandom because i didn't know how they would accept i didn't realize at the time that there's been very when i accepted to do it um uh the probably one of the first books being taken over by first characters being taken over by by someone else um it was quite an unusual concept whereas nowadays in europe um, because that older generation are all long gone the, the they 
the publishers generally find ways of rejuvenating series one way or another um, uh, to carry on, um, sometimes against the wishes of the actual IP owners, of the original authors, but um, it, not in the case of Tintin, although that, Tintin's ironclad, it was, I hear, I've heard stories that it was specifically met, mentioned in Hergé's will that it was never to be done by anyone else other than uh, other than himself and on his death, Tintin stopped. Um, whereas that that's not really a, a modern 20th century look at production <laughs> these days. And publishers tend to want to actually find ways around it. Uh, so, but it's, La Jeunesse certainly sorted that out. But uh, I only gradually, because I went away and was pretty much just doing script would arrive from Charlet from all over the world. And I was just trying the best I could living in Brussels, um, working with the editor, uh, of delivering work that was good enough and regular enough that we were going to have a book come out at the other end. And they seemed happy with what I was doing. And it was a great, another great learning experience for me. Um, but I was never very sure because I was definitely very nervous in, those, in, the, in that, especially with the first book, um, about whether I could do stuff fast enough of a good, with a good enough um, uh, technique to actually keep the fans happy, basically. Uh, but it seemed to work. Um, how many pages were you were you producing for for, for these books? Um, they they used to be forty eight. Uh, standard format in those days was forty eight pages. Occasionally, Charlie would run over a page or two, and they'd change the formatting around. Or so, in some books with Giro, they're forty six or forty four. Um, but it was fairly tied down. There was lots of limitations involved in it um, because they'd also rather annoyingly. Um, sell it pre-production that would start running in a newspaper with a page a week or a page a day as well and inevitably you were very much aware that um, it was going to catch you up pretty quickly um, uh, so I really fought long and hard to keep that as delayed as long as possible so that um, the album the story was pretty much finished the book was pretty much finished but there were also constraints because in a lot of places um, uh, pages were reproduced in magazines and newspapers half a page a day um, so that, the, the, that it was very hard to break down pages that didn't have that have that middle panel break um, between the top and the bottom um, and that was kind of annoying to have to work with to begin with because I kind of like to play around a little bit more with the um, the 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 paneling basically um, but with Charlie you don't get much of a choice anyway because you're looking at maybe what five panels a page for for dread um, you were lucky with anything, if you got anything less than 10, sometimes 12 panels a page and very verbose scenarios as well. I mean, they're just huge text balloons. So often you're cramming in drawings in little corners because some clown's talking for, you know, two paragraphs. <laughs> and then there's three other people in the same panel supposed to be talking as well. So you pretty much were constrained for that too, but it was all a, a, uh, a pretty, uh, good experience to, to figure out how to do it. And also when John started producing um, uh, the next story himself, he was living in Los Angeles by that time. And I was in, sort of more or less given charge of tidying up his pages and getting them all ready and making sure that all the blacks were good and black enough for the reproduction when the pages arrived in Brussels with, with the editor, which was a, a company called Nobody at the time. So I was pretty much getting fed the raw material um, and seeing Jean occasionally when he came back uh, a little bit later as well. Um, it was good to be able to, you know, immerse myself entirely in the world of Blueberry. And uh, it seemed to work. Yeah, I, I guess it, it, it continued for a while. I think you kept moving around uh, sort of Western Europe during this yeah, period. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit, yes. <laughs> we were very much aware that we couldn't get turfed out. Um, if we got turfed out, we weren't coming back. So um, we didn't want to get on the wrong side of authorities a little bit like what the situation was in London. And we had no, no, no idea of how complicated it was um, to get uh, our cut de séjour, uh, our work permits and things. Uh, I think Janet went along to see someone in Paris in the first month or two that we were there and they literally laughed at her face <laughs> about how naive we were. <laughs> um, there was just no way, unless you had a huge amount of money, um, there's no way that you could, you could actually get your way through the process. Um, uh, because basically that's the 
the process was there for that. They didn't want poor people. I mean, no country wants to have any other country's poor people. You have to prove that you've got the finances to actually get good lawyers and fight your way through that kind of shit. But it took us a long time. And eventually it was only Blueberry that earned the uh, earned us our papers. And even that was after a bit of a battle. So yeah, we lived in the south of France in a little village for a, a six month period. We went and lived in six months in Amsterdam. All very exciting um, because you know all the stuff's all new to me. So I, I love going to new places. Uh, and then we moved to to Brussels to be close to the editor. And uh, so I think we finished up by being there for three years. And then once we did crack our, our work permit situation, we pretty much moved to France fairly quickly as well because um, uh, Brussels can be it's a great place and I had some wonderful memories of it. But it can be pretty grim at winter time so we wanted to move somewhere it was a little bit more a little bit warmer <laughs> um 1989 uh was quite a profound year because um uh jean-michel charlier passed away mm -hmm. uh what effect did this have on your ongoing involvement with blueberry and you know what decisions did it precipitate in your career it um it was fairly devastating but it took a little bit a little bit of time for us to realize how devastating it would be because by that stage we'd done two we I did two and a half books and we become a, we'd bought our own house in in uh in provence and we're living the life and um not having to have too much contact with publishers it was charlie had been amazingly like a, a benevolent uncle to us because he handled all negotiations with editors um, for obvious reasons but he really really looked after us as, after us amazingly well because um, I think he probably realized how th how how what skating on thin ice we were we were you know we were there and it was a good thing because we worked hard um, but we didn't take anything for granted and he realized that he, uh, he seemed to want to help us out as much as possible and he was incredibly nice to us looked after us every time we came to Paris and um, I was privileged because it was Blueberry so all the other Charlier series suffered through him not doing any script and delivering things and there used to be horrible stories about people other artists having to sell their houses and things uh, because there was no he couldn't he wasn't writing stories but he was always writing Blueberry so I, I was I was lucky to get the stories coming as often as the publisher wanted and as often as I could possibly produce anyway. Uh, so when he died, I was in an unusual position in a way because um, I had no, John was still in the States at that time. And um, he was also being looked after by an, an agent of his and had a team of lawyers and all sorts of things that were could get involved with. But I wanted to be as independent as possible. and. Um, uh, just do la jeunesse. I'd had no no uh, no dreams of trying to take over anything. I didn't want to have anything to do with the the main series because if Jean was doing Blueberry, he's the only person that should be doing Blueberry. Even I shouldn't be doing Blueberry if Jean's doing Blueberry. <laughs> um, and that was the only thing I was interested in. Um, but um, I got an agreement from from the, from Jean and Jean Michel uh, to be quite independent. Um, and unfortunately, it was the paper it was signed by us, but it was drawn up in such a way that when lawyers got hold of it later, um, uh, it gave me a lot of control over the whole ser the whole character of Blueberry. In the case of uh, anyone dying, I kind of had inherited the rights to it. And um, when when Jean Michel Chalier died, and they found their copy of the contract in his affairs afterwards, the family went ballistic um, uh, when they saw this and and we had to get legal advice and try to figure out how, what we we're gonna do. And of course, publishers are your best friend in those sort of situations. Uh, they treat you like royalty because you might have something that they want. And I hated that business. I didn't want anything to do with it, but there was a so, subsequent major difficulties with um, uh, Jean-Michel Chalier's son who was determined to take over the whole production line of his of his father, not in the writing sense, but in the controlling of the business sense. And we fairly rapidly, the writing was on the wall because I wasn't interested in um, in working with him or or having having to suffer the 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 legalities of 
mistakes that he was making um, as far as um, what advice he was getting from lawyers and signing deals with publishers that without consulting or without showing any interest in asking us. And it became fairly obvious John had come back to, to live in France uh, at the time. And it was becoming obvious that he was not at that particular point in his career going to disagree with the Chartiers on any of the business levels. Um, he, he, he had, he'd already said in print that um, he'd always, uh, what's the word, accede, uh, agree to whatever Jean-Michel Chartier wanted. And um, and so therefore didn't wasn't interested in arguing legalities or whatever with uh, Philippe Chalier after Jean Michel had died he was he had his other things going on that were much more of relevance to him so um, we were kind of pretty much left on our own to sort of argue um, I had invited um, the, the a writer who was um, a friend at the time who had actually been the person that put me in contact with Chalier and Giro um, a friend called Francois Cordigiani. Um, who was, I had asked him to at least finish the first, the book that Charlier had written half of. W would he be interested in, in, um, in, in finishing that book and we could, with, to look to the future of maybe writing the series as well? Because as far as I was concerned, that was my choice. It was a hard thing to convince Giro of that at the, initially, but when we next saw him, but he was involved with other things involved legally as well. And so it was pretty much, because Giro was always, we were earning money for Giro with each of the books that we were producing as well because he had a good slice of the royalties. Um, and so um, uh, Francois Cordigiani became the writer for the series and eventually finished up by doing three more books as well with him uh, before other complications came up. And I really got to the point with, with Janet and I got to the point where we didn't really want to be fighting battles with Philippe Chalier with lawyers and all the kind of business the sharks were circling in a way and i'd never got involved never gotten involved in comics to do that i wanted to, to to draw the stories that i was interested in and 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 have fun doing them i didn't want to be battling with lawyers and um it took all the fun out of it for something that i'd already achieved uh anyway so we pretty much decided to walk I've never regretted it at all, but I was so pleased at the time that we woke up to the fact that I just didn't want to work with these people um, under these kind of conditions uh, because that wasn't what I got involved in comics. To, comics were, were a passion for me. And uh, if the passion goes out of it, um, you know, what's the point? I don't want to be just grinding it out for the sake of it. Uh, and I was, at that stage, I was prepared to come back to find a, a place to stay in, in, in Melbourne here in Australia and stack things on supermarket shelves if I had to because um, uh, I thought this was you know I'd done everything like way more than everything that I'd ever expected to be able to do with comics and uh, so I thought well okay well th that, that's my career in comics let's do something else but um, the internet came along and um, pretty much saved uh, my, my comic career because it was just at the time when you know, within the within the two or three years of um, of coming back to Australia, that the internet became possible to be able to work no matter where you are, which is what I've done ever since, basically. And then 2000 AD came calling again after yes, all those years. Yes, yeah, that, I actually did do some couple of stories. Um, it was also the just at the time that I was getting into uh, doing more work on a computer as well, not not to the extent that Brian and and probably Dave were doing, but um, uh, Dave had given me a lot of pointers actually. On, at the time um, about computing. And um, so I started to do a little bit of coloring on my own and working in Photoshop and also became quite a passion of mine just fooling around with computers anyway. So uh, it was good timing because um, keeping ahead of the internet was kind of difficult in France because um, France were in a strange position because they had this thing called Minitel, which was kind of a, an unusual Gaelic take on the internet. But it also meant that the internet was very slow at starting in, in France because they thought they had their own version um, and, and, and it wasn't. But, um, but coming back to Australia, we got some decent internet speeds and I could actually uh, pick up. I had, a, I had one job for an uh, Italian publisher, which was a two year job doing a book called Tex, which is like the, the Italian um, version of Blueberry in some ways, um, which has been going a lot longer than Blueberry has actually. It's been going since the 40s. Um, and I had a, a big 220 page book to do um, that I could bring back with me, and they were quite happy if I sent the original pages over um, to um, to Italy, and the book came out 
several years later. Um, but that kept me going and just bridged that period of, I think that was the last work I ever sent away in the mail. And from then on, it became just uh, sending files away via the internet. One, one thing I'm, I'm interested in is uh, for somebody who is very good at tech, who's very mechanically minded, um, you know, over a decade spent on effectively Westerns, not an awful lot of opportunity, I would imagine, for, for <laughs> kind of technological drawing, if well, you will. That came along just at the Janet and I separated and she came back to live in, uh, in New Zealand for a year, uh, which was 95, I think, 94, 95. Um, and, she, and when she decided to come back uh, to our house in, in Provence uh, and us to get together again, um, she came back with this idea that there's something with, with these things called computers going on that I've seen in New Zealand. Maybe you might be interested in them. And it just, it, that was the opening of the door, basically, um, um, to actually realizing, starting to realize just how much of an important thing they were going to be. Um, so we, we went out and immediately bought the most expensive Mac that we could find. and. Um, it's probably still out in the garage actually here. Uh, but it, I just became really fascinated by it all. So it was, um, it was good timing in a way. Um, but it was also the end of my involvement with Westerns effectively until fairly recently, because I'd pretty much in the 10 years, I'd buried myself in reading up and researching the American Civil War, uh, trying to get all the Matthew Brady books and, the, and the picking up documentation like that to make Blueberry as realistic as I possibly could. Um, and I, I, was, I enjoy that kind of stuff, uh, doing the background stuff. And um, Westerns was a genre I knew very little about other than the films I'd watched um, to begin with. But by the end of it, after 10 years of doing Blueberry, I was really enjoying um, uh, researching all the kind of detail and stuff uh, and finding out the material that was usable in some way uh, with doing a Western. Um, but um, I wouldn't want to do that. It's, I've always found that it's nice to have a genre change every, every so often. Um, so Blueberry was the last French Western. Tex was probably the last Western, um, conventional Western that I did. And we, I was back into science fiction for doing a little bit of work for 2000 AD. Well, I think, uh, you, you were brought on to, uh, in a nice kind of cyclical uh, way, you were brought on to do a, a couple of short stories on Mercy Heights, which is kind of in the convoluted continuity of the original Rogue Trooper is supposedly <laughs> where he eventually ended up as, uh, as Tor Cyan. Because yeah, I, I, I jumped at the chance purely because I saw copies of work that Kev Walker was doing with the character. And I thought that was fantastic. It was, it was, I, I wasn't aware of, I nev, I've never met Kev and I wasn't aware of his work at the time until I, until someone like Andy must have sent me some photocopies of, or some files of the, of the pages and I thought, this is great stuff. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd try my hand at doing a couple of those stories. Um, I can't remember what else I was involved with at the time, but anyway, yeah, it was, a, it was a good time to be able to start doing work and being able to deliver it electronically. Uh, I think I may have come over and actually met Andy just at the time that um, Rebellion were interested in buying um, 2080 because they, they were in an office in London at the time. And um, Andy and I had kind of hit it off uh, fairly quickly there and we were good friends. And um, so it was, a, it, was a, it was interesting to do a couple of stories then. I can't remember which way, it was several dread stories, I think as well um, at the time. And it, I've subsequently, tried to do each decade i've tried to be able to do one one piece of work at least for 2000 ad over the last what four decades now so i'm just coming up now to we're in the fifth decade now so i'll see if i can do some stories in the next couple of years for them uh, for 2000 or for you <laughs> for 2000 ad it would be quite fun um, because of it's just nice to have been able to change genres and touch bases but yet still come back to do um genres that I've enjoyed before, but it's good to have a break from them. I'm at the moment just doing a story, which is for a, a series for a European publisher, which is very much like a, they, they wanted me to do a Western. Um, and I've never wanted to do a Cowboys Western because I did that already with Blueberry. I wanted to do a different kind of Western, but it's actually involving Hollywood making Westerns in the landscape, which I love. Um, so I can actually, it looks like a Western to the people that want to see Blueberry there. And it's actually got other things going on it for, for, um, for interest sake. And uh, instead of a, um, they, they sprung this one on me, but instead of a horse, this guy rides around on a 1927 
Harley Davidson. No, it's an Indian actually, I think. No, Harley Davidson motorcycle. And uh, I've been a motorcycle fan for my life. So it's actually, they slipped that in. It was actually a really nice mix, uh, the writers. And, and uh, they didn't tell me they were going to do that, but uh, I thought that worked quite well. So I'm doing a Western again now, effectively. And I'm working on my third book of that series now. I, I think it was um, David Bishop, who's a fellow Kiwi, uh, mm-hmm. who d- described who I've never you met, as... actually. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, no, that's interesting. Yeah. He, he described you as a rarity um, because you, you've... you've <laughs> that's had, nice. Um, um, it's nicer than it sounds. Uh, you've had success oh, in no, I, think I, was, uh, I, I didn't mean that ironically at all. Oh, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> I think the worst thing in the world would be to call, be called normal. <laughs> You, 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 you've found success in, in, in Britain and Europe, but also America, because uh, after um, uh, the, the turn of the millennium, mm. um, you, uh, you ended up doing um, Los Angeles, which w- the original name was Welcome to oh, the Ice Age, I believe. Uh, yeah, that was done while I was still in France. Um, right. Okay. Uh, with, with the difficulties that were going on with Blueberry, and we were getting uh, uh, having problems with the supply of script and with all the delays involved in arguing about who owned what, I just I wanted to do something, and that was a a, a science fiction book that an idea that I conceived of and got it, worked with a friend to write it. But it turned out to be a very different project than what um, what I'd originally planned it to be. Um, but it also was very unsatisfactory because I was determined to branch out into a kind of different style, a full color kind of um, color direct kind of style. And I quickly learned that I didn't have this, the chops for it, basically. <laughs> it was uh, much more difficult than I imagined. And so I'm, it's the kind of forgotten book of all of the, the, the books that I've done in Europe. Um, the one that probably did interest me more was the kind of European style book that I did for 2080 on Rain Dogs a little bit after that. Um, uh, that was one of the projects that was, hope, I think 2080, we were hoping to maybe produce books in the 54 page European hard covered format and um, so I jumped at the chance of doing that which I actually had a lot of fun doing that story um, uh, I think may have actually even done the coloring yeah the coloring would have been done on Photoshop as well um, previously all my work had been done my color work had been done by Janet who was a had become quite a successful colorist in the in the 12 years that we'd lived in Europe and was working for other artists but um, when Photoshop came along she said no no, no I'm not interested um, it's just not the same as working with the painted gouache and, and um, doing uh, the kind of color, the way that color was done in European comics with blues and things. Um, so I did a little bit of those, some of the torso and stories I would have colored myself, maybe I think Rain Dogs as well. Um, but it was, once again, it's a good opportunity to learn the processes involved um, because they've become normal now. Um, maybe not uh, as far as me doing my own color because now I prefer that, like writing, I prefer to work with other people and have kind of a collaboration um, with the, the finished product with other other authors. Uh, but it was good. It was an interesting time to be able to do some work in science fiction again. Yeah, because I mean, it, that looking back at the stuff that you've done uh, previously, uh, particularly in the Shadow of the Sun, um, yeah, you, you, you've you've got that interest in the gritty sci-fi, the kind of post-apocalyptic mm. dystopia stuff. So it, it's interesting for me how, you know, you, you did Rain Dogs, you did Tor Cyan, um, well, Mercy Heights, uh, and, and then you, you come into this, this run of doing things like uh, Headshot with... Um, uh, the European the, writer. The European writer, whose name I've completely forgotten now. Oh, um, Mats. Mats, uh, there, we go. The, there the, we go. The, the, his name is Alexei... Uh, in actual fact, Matt's is a pseudonym, but uh, uh, um, yeah, he's he was a he's a writer. I'd seen some work in Europe um, doing with a uh, called Latour, the Killer, with another artist, and I thought it was really interesting. And I was at at the time talking to the publisher, and they said, "Oh, we'll give you his number. He's got interesting ideas. Maybe you two guys could work together." And we finished up by he'd actually written that as a film script uh, originally, with the first draft of it I saw as a, was a film script, shooting script, a full shooting script and um he said okay now i'll just read it we'll we'll rejig it and and um do it as a uh, three album book series and uh it was really good because i'd always thought i I could have a bit of fun with um, the sort of crime genre as well detective story and uh, lots of action and interesting ideas going on and uh, i was quite proud of that um and uh, alexi and i have been good friends to this day actually we 
I'm constantly jiving them to come up with some and something new because maybe we could find some time in our busy schedules um, to uh, to do something together again. And we I always go and have a drink with them when I'm in in Paris. Uh, so that it was a good. It was a, it's a genre once again which. I enjoy reading probably more so than science fiction. Um, so, so it was a genre that I wanted to try my hand at. It, it, it's, it, I find it really interesting because at that particular point in, in say, cinematic um, uh, crime uh, thrillers, mm -hmm. there, there was that more cool European flavour to them to, in the early 2000s and into the, the, the 2010s. Um, that that sense of uh, so I, my mind's gone completely blank, so I can't think of anything <laughs> right now. But you get what I mean. Um, I kind of it, anyway. Only thing I think you might be referring to is something like um, the Samurai, uh, the Alan Delon film, very existential. Yeah, which is um, uh, is it, it, it it's it, it dovetails nicely with your your classic Raymond Chandler writing style, very concise, and and of course you've got Tarantino rejuvenating a, a, that kind of genre as well with um, his new approach to dialogue. So Alexi's very much aware of uh, uh, most French people, most French authors and, and creative people adore everything American. And so the genre of uh, uh, Le Policier, uh, Siri Noir, um, is a big thing for Alexi. So uh, uh, he kind of used, based that on, uh, based that whole interest in producing something like um, um, Oh, what's it called? <laughs> I forgot. I've got, now I've got brain fade. <laughs> uh, getting too old for this, really am. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's that that seems to have uh, sparked a kind of uh, a new phase of your career because it, then you worked with Ed Brubaker on Point Blank for Wildstorm, mm -hmm. which which mm -hmm. I mean it, he's he's the king of comics crime, really. Well, it's, and it was pitched. Richard, my involvement was pitched to me uh, by Dark Horse as crime but in actual fact it became very much a, a lead into to sean's more superhero orientated sort of feel to it um I, I, but i once again i had no idea where the story was going when i when i first started work on it and i was kind of a little bit leery about all these sort of superhero tropes starting to appear in the story and then also got a little bit tied into knots because of um having to introduce characters that Sean was working on that was going to be published after it that they no one had told me about uh, when I first got involved in it as well so it was a strange kind of a, a production uh, uh, but once again interesting for me because they gave me enough lead time that I could do how many was it five five monthlies I'm not sure or five trades I think collection no I, I can't remember um, but to, to produce work because it's normally 22 pages uh, is not possible for me to produce every month uh, because I've got no interest in working with a pencil or in a colorist or well the colorist doesn't matter but the, um, I, I work with colorists all the time now but uh, I didn't want to be part of a team where someone pencils it and someone inks it um, uh, I wanted to at least do the artwork and um, and so that was a it was a good experience as well but um, it's kind of hard work uh, uh, delivering that amount of work um, uh, that quickly. Uh, and I kind of had to cut corners, but again, it led to other work from the American market as well, which was good at that particular time for me. So um, I was quite happy. Um, eventually I was, got involved with um, Star Wars and Battle of Britain and with Garth. And uh, uh, each time was able to negotiate a length of time to be able to produce work before they started publishing it. Um, which nowadays I guess they do all the time with people, but um, uh, they were pretty much tied into monthly schedules, it seems, except for the big stars uh, at that stage. But I had a an editor at Wildstorm, uh, or at um, Dark Horse, um, that had enjoyed my European work. He was aware of, oh, actually with, with Wildstorm as well at the time, was Scott Dunbier was working for Wildstorm. So that they, they were aware of my work and so, when they could contact me via the internet, they said, "Oh, we, we'd you know be interested in you doing something for us one day," and uh, that's where why those American that American period fitted in nicely with uh, with my move back to Australia. Well, you did a a, a stint on um, on the Losers with Andy Diggle, who's a big fan of your work, um, mm -hmm. so a bit of a dream come true for him. Um, the thing that fascinates fascinates me though, particularly considering your comments at, at the beginning of of our chat about being more of an alien person than a Star Wars person is of course you, you, you did two series 
of uh, of Star Wars. You did um, Legacy and Invasion. Uh, yeah, I believe. worked on worked on a couple of trial things to more or less um, uh, do fill in issues for a bit a bit like what the losers with Jock, you know, as well. Just mainly because of Jock and Andy that. I thought oh, I'll, I'll give that a shot for those three issues to help out if they need someone. Uh, but Star Wars was once again you, you get trialed when someone can't keep up with the production and they need a fill-in issue done by someone. And so I did a couple of things like that. And although I'm not the world's greatest Star Wars fan, and um, to this day I haven't seen the for me, which was what the third, the fourth, fifth, and sixth of them. I've never actually seen the films. <laughs> the first well, three. Most of them, you're not missing much, to be honest with you. No, well, well and also it's not my genre of, of science fiction, but I mean, who's going to turn down the offer of working on Star Wars for a little while? And it was, and it was great because um, it also gave me the opportunity, purely by accident, to, to meet Tom Taylor, who was a, a, a comic fan who was doing writing pieces of theatre here in, in Melbourne uh, at the time. And he contacted me and, um, and said, was asking, you know, like I'd, I'd quite like to get into comics. Can we have, sit down and have a talk about it? And um, I quickly discovered that he knew more about Star Wars than I'd ever known anyway. Uh, so he was supplying me with a lot of reference material. And then we started introducing the idea of um, him maybe writing something. And eventually we got our own Star Wars arc for three trade paperbacks with uh, with Dark Horse, thanks to thanks to the editor. And uh, it was a great introduction to Europe, to American comics for Tom, who's now gone on to be pretty well known in the genre um, in the in the states um and um and it was he was t it was i was lucky because he was a near neighbor here in melbourne and we're still very good friends uh, although he's far too busy to have uh, much time to see me these days but uh he still only lives five minutes away from here and uh, i'm good friends with the family and uh it's just been a real pleasure to see someone else's career move along like that over the space of the last 10 years because uh, i i kind of figured that he had this had the chops as a as a writer but i had no idea that it would work this well for him um and we had a great time uh randy was it was was good because he allowed us to to work in our own little box basically and just maybe drop in the the familiar faces for cameo appearances in our story um and so um that was enough that i wasn't slavishly redoing the same star wars base stories uh, that I would not be have been interested in doing because all those were done by people you know 25 years ago 30 years ago that were uh, done by the the classics of like Al Williamson and those kind of people um, and I wasn't interested in kind of repeating that uh, that kind of thing again so it was it was nice it was good fun to um, to do um, and it also gave me something to do before I got and to get to San Diego, in actual fact, to, and where I ran into the French publisher who was visiting the convention um, that um, that I'm working for at the moment. One thing I, you, you you have mentioned is that you you worked with um, Garth Ennis on Battle of Britain. Yes. Um, yeah. Now, if if the if there's a meeting of, of minds, then I, I think that's that's probably it because you know uh, he obsessed with. Um, a historical detail and and the the, the planes and, well, and and thing of the series. You, you, you never know. I was a little bit leery to begin with because you never know what Garth Ennis you're going to get because because I didn't want the Garth Ennis of one end of his production because that 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 was it's not my kind of material. Um, I'm glad it exists, but it's not the kind of thing that I'd normally be interested in working on. Whereas a tribute to Maybe not so much Battle of Britain because it's it's a little bit of a walking cliche, but a tribute to that kind of war picture library, air race books that I grew up on, and especially uh, Ian Kennedy um, was actually right up my alley because I, I I'd been a huge fan of his since 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 before I knew who he even was. I used to search for a signature on the on the first page. As it used to be a little K disguised in some of the background detail, and I eventually got to realise who he was, but. Um, uh, I I'd, I'd just absolutely adored his work on, on um, at that time, it was Air Ace, probably the ones I was looking at, um, al along with quite a few other very well-known European artists who were working for, for Fleetway um, in the 50s and early 60s doing that work. So doing something, you know, war stories, another genre that interests me, and I knew that Garth wouldn't do something completely trivial, it would be fun to do. Um, and it was a good opportunity to get to meet him and, and uh, and do something with them uh, on that as well. 
I'm not sh quite sure how successful it was. Um, it was because I understand it was a little bit like a vanity project that, that um, who uh, was a bit, was it DC or Wildstorm at the time probably. Uh, it was it could, was Wildstorm, yeah. Said that he could have a pick and choose any of the legacy characters that the publisher had the rights to, and um, they probably never even knew and probably still don't know who Battle of Britain was. But uh, um, I didn't mind at all because it was the kind of thing that you know drawing planes and. And daring do in North Africa was I was quite happy with it, and uh, so it was good fun. Well, we, we we're bringing out a, bat, a, a bunch of Battle of Britain, um, the original uh, because, ones. Yeah, because we, we we own the archive now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, looking at the Hugo Pratt stuff and also Ian Kennedy yeah. and all that and the other. It's, it's, For, yeah, it's good work. Please, please talk about the original guys because uh, uh, they were so hard to figure out who they were back in those days. Um, you know, Solano Lopez, Pratt, uh, some of the Westerns were done by Italian guys that were, um, I, I wasn't a fan of at the time, but they're really, really well known. Gino D'Antonio doing uh, the war stories. I mean, that stuff is just, some of them are classics. A lot of them are, okay, fairly throwaway. Uh, I have no idea of the, of the, of the right, even the writers' names who did them at the, at the time, but there was some, I've seen them seen them often reprinted, and for a while, someone in the UK was doing collections of them. But they still didn't credit the original authors. Um, and and please, rebellion, at least well, mention who these people well, were. Well, where where, where 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 we can, we 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 do. I think the um, uh, my memory's on on the blink as it normally is. Uh, I think it might be the Ian, the Ian Kennedy book that we're bringing out. We we just don't know. Like there's no record of uh, that we that we know oh, of, who the writer was of, of who the writer was oh. yeah oh yeah yeah well it's the, 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 the those that that was the story of the days that they were published and really there was no no credits for anything in those days um and it's only through the the actual quality of the work of the artists that you can actually now understand who you know and and realize that that was some of their formative years uh, and and in kennedy was one of the standouts for me um a couple of them i don't know who they were i used to recognize Hugo pratt's work uh afterwards because it was so distinctive i was aware of i don't know who he was but i was aware of this his work looking so different than anything else um and and the, and really quite exciting um so it was it's great that i mean i uh, to, to know that Ian's still around and still uh, um, being able to enjoy the benefits of his stardom, you know, in later life, because um, that, that kind of, that, that work was really fundamental for people like me, looking at the mechanics of how you do do comics. Uh, it was it was a great influence on me. Once again, that's that accurate line style. I think the actual draftsmanship is just, a, is just superb um, and is flying flying skills um in the in the stories that he did were just exceptional the, the storytelling excellent um I, i'm conscious that i've i've kept you on the line for a very long time so I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll round up and it's it's i mean it's what half past 10 at night over there so uh, uh i won't keep God, you too much too. longer Jeez, I, feel free to edit out <laughs> the uninteresting bits <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's 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 all it's all been interesting believe me um i, I just want to round it off by by um Recalling a question that I that I asked you eleven years ago when when we chatted for the magazine, which is how you think you've changed and evolved over over the course of your career. Because I I, I look at your your early work on Judge Dredd and Rogue Troop, and it, it's such a, a distinctive you know European French style. Um, and then I, I look at the stuff that you've done with with two thousand AD um uh, during the rebellion period and it's still so recognizably yours how do you think you've changed and uh, or, or, or stayed the same well, well, well it's it's impossible for me to tell i um i i've often tried to do some st it's a new genre of stories i've tried to uh, okay this time i'm going to do this in a different way and it and it'll be I'll approach it in a completely different way and try to make it visually different. But when this, it, when it all comes out, it's, it looks just like me d having done it. So, it, and it, that's uh, for me that's annoying because I'd love to be able to 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 do something that people wouldn't immediately recognise as my work because it, it's it that that's that means it would be successful and interesting. I admire artists that can do that. Um, uh, so, I I. I don't tend to look at the work that I've done 
very much later. And all like, because all you ever see is things that you could have done better. Um, and I have no idea um, uh, what the difference is between my work from 40 years ago to today. I mean, okay, maybe the draftsmanship's a little bit better. Um, um, but it's, 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 it's really difficult for me to, to, to tell. And I don't actually li like looking at my old work. Occasionally I'll flick through something and think that, oh, I did a reasonable job. Did I do that? Um, you know, or something. Uh, can't, you know, because it's, you get to the stage where you can't remember all of the things you've done. But it's very, I have no idea, really. Um, uh, it, it's for others to, others to comment on. Um, because we look at, look at the stuff, you know, hours and hours a day. And by the time I get to the end of a story, I'm so tired of working on that particular story. I just want to, that's why I don't color my work anymore because I just, well, at all, because I, I just don't want to spend another month or two months doing the color of a story that I've been working away on for six months. I just, right, okay, that's done, on to, the, on to another project. And um, uh, you, you spend so much time slaving over the actual pages uh, that, it's all just burnt into your brain that that's the way it looks. And you have no, it's a little bit, I can never figure out how people can understand the movies they're making um, at the end of it because they work for years and years doing this thing and they know the story backwards and forwards before the filming has ever even started. Um, so that when you're actually doing the nuts and bolts, you have no sense of perspective on what, what you're working on. I find it very difficult to step back because you get so involved in the day to day. Um, you only can look at it years later and and have have it said in a slightly fresher way. Um, uh, so I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I yeah, I don't think of my work that way. I don't think of work that way at all. It's um, I'm just happy if people read it. Um, basically, people you, still you, want to read it after all this time. You you've had. You've done so much work in, 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 in Europe, in European comics, and it's, you know, I've commented on this, it's often been commented that um, in France and Belgium and, and other European countries, comics are taken so, uh, so much more seriously than they necessarily are in, in, uh, in, 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 in Britain and America. Um, do you, number one, do you feel that, that that is the case? And number two, do you, how do you think that has necessarily impacted your career as you've gone along uh i'm not sure whether it's hard to say whether people take them more seriously or not it's just that they the 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 genre the the, the format the whatever the metier is considered to be worthy in a general sense um okay you get the passionate fans and they're really very very passionate about certain things um but european comics has kind of never had that disposable part of what American comics is like. American comics are quick reads and in most cases disposable. That's what they used to be like. So it's obviously different now with collecting and things. But uh, whereas in Europe, you read a book and you put it away on the shelf and then a year later, you'd look or two years later or 10 years later, you'd pick it up and look at it again. When the next book comes out, people will go back and read the previous book. And so it's, it's a little bit like any other kind of media. It fits into a continuity that is treated seriously on an artistic level, on a creative level, um, which it has an inherent worth that is not disposable. Um, and I find that I, I enjoy a situation where now I'm working on my 26th book for Europe. Um, it's, it's wonderful to actually see the books there. I don't want to look at them. I don't like looking at them inside, but I actually like the fact that they're there. It's a kind of things that I, I'm, I'm not proud of the, work I've done in the sense of any artistic statement or worthiness and anything because it's a it's it's a we're working in a in a commercial industry but I'm proud that I've been able to be in a in a in a, a situation where I can have those books there that other people seem to find interesting um, and I've been able to be in a position of having them because originally who would have thought working in 2000 AD and 1980, 1981, that we'd be talking about this like 40, 42 years later. No way did we think that anything like that would happen. We were working in a disposable medium that was in entertainment, but in actual fact, it's 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 fits. It's created its own 
niche in a genre of publication that normally wasn't what didn't exist uh, uh, a lot of times. The same thing with people doing EC comics in the 50s. Uh, uh, you know, they would have had no idea that students would be doing theses on that kind of work uh, nowadays because it's just treated uh, in, this, in the genre sense, treated a little bit more seriously. Um, it's looked at as being valid now, whereas comics, when I grew up, were never valid in that sense. They were, they were disposable items that um, were on your way to convince you that you should be reading books, basically, uh, uh, for me as a, in a childhood sense. And it's just nice to be able to see that comics now are appreciated as a worthy genre in, in the most general sense. Um, so uh, as far as my place in the, on the scale of within there, I don't care. It, it's, um, it's, it's just that I'm, I'm pleased to have been part of it or to still be part of it. I'm, I'm curious, uh, uh, all the way through this uh, conversation, I've been looking at the wall behind you and trying oh, to yeah. uh, play, yeah. place what's, what, <laughs> what, what's up there. I mean, it, 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 is this all kind of inspirational art or is it particularly pieces that you're particularly fond of? Uh, it changes all the time. The little things are, are unusual because I just started out doing little sketches, often just sketching someone else's work. To, to learn something from it, uh, but also to try to make force me to not keep drawing the same things all the time, learn something, physical um, aspects of characters, caricatures, um, that kind of thing. But And then also to, I often do these little things now to work out characters that for myself, um, there's a lot done on pencil, you know, with little bits of paper as well, but it just became something to decorate the walls or there are all the little things around. There's hundreds of them all over the place that you can't see. But in between, there's, there's like a blueberry page here and some of my other work back there. Um, and I just changed it around it all, but I, I abhor blank walls. Walls, because I, I, I never used to, in places where I rented, I never used to be able to stick stuff on the wall, whereas now it's just, um, it, it, it also stops me putting it everywhere else in the house as well. Uh, got to, <laughs> got to give, give other people's eyeballs a little bit of a rest. But in here, I'll look things, you know, just amusing for me. And, and uh, I'll, I'll often do little warm-up sketches. Um, if I haven't done any work for a week or two, uh, I'll do, do a couple of little things quickly with felt pens. A little bit like um, I'll also do that for if I'm going to on a book signing tour. Um, because in Europe we're expected to do little drawings in every book that we sign uh, as well. So you, you, when you're going to conventions, you're faced with six or seven hours of sitting down sketching and sketching really fast in books. Um, so I need to often get up to speed. So I'll do little little warm up warm up exercises with the Copic markers and and felt pens and stuff uh, just uh, to get my free out my hand a little bit um, because you can't be too precious about books that you've got to sign that quickly. Uh, whereas um, when you're working on a page, you want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so um, you can tend to get a little bit constipated doing that. Uh, that's why I enjoy going to conventions uh, a lot as well, because um, apart from the fact that you finally get to meet your fans uh, and, and meet the public that you're catering to, uh, it forces you to work on a different kind of technique and learn not to be too precious about your work. Brilliant. Colin, um, I've taken up an awful lot of your time so <laughs> thank you so much for that i really appreciate that it's it's been so good to talk oh, again. No, it's, it's been a pleasure here and sitting in australia and actually talking to someone about my work because i still remain relatively unknown uh, my work appearing in europe all the time that uh, and to be able to sit down and talk english to someone about the work because uh, it's been good fun so thank you very much <laughs> not at all not at all like i say the the that first panel of the marauders with the hopper emerging from that that <laughs> hulk i mean i, I don't there, there aren't many uh, I, I, when i was younger i had aspirations to be a, a, a comic book artist i don't think i ever tried to copy a panel as much as i tried to copy <laughs> that one so uh, thanks for i that. think i know i think i know the panel the, the page you talk about it's one of the last stories i did while i was it was actually done in a hotel room in Paris. Um, the owner of the flat came back and we had to go to a hotel for a weekend. And I, I think I'd do that in a hotel, but um, it's one of the few pages I never got back <laughs> when the originals returned. Uh, strangely enough, there were a couple of others. But I, was, I d didn't expect to get anything back, back from back in those days anyway. So uh, when the originals turned up, uh, that was one of the few that didn't make it. I don't think uh, right. uh, of the story, but um, yeah, it was a good period. I was, I, was, I was pretty happy with what I was doing with, 
and it was um i was enjoying road trooper at that stage and it was good fun yeah brilliant well look i'll let you go but thank you again a huge all right, no problem at all. fantastic stuff thank you so much to colin for taking the time to chat there good long proper in-depth chat love them uh, we're going to be back in a few days time for another deep dive plus another creator interview um as I've said in previous episodes, do let us know what you think uh, about the podcast. If you've got any suggestions for guests that you'd like us to interview, uh, email us at thrillcast at 2080.com. It's all one word, thrillcast at 2080.com. I had some good suggestions through. going to see if we can act on those. Um, stuff that's coming out uh, this month, I think I mentioned it in the last episode, actually. You've got Case Files 35, which is digital only. The key one this month is Smash. Now, I know I've mentioned this already, but uh, if you... Go along to the 2000 AD uh, web shop. You can pre-order your copy. It's not going to be available through news agents just because of virus. I'll leave it at that. Um, but this is an absolutely cracking collection. I've seen some of the artwork for this. You've got Charlie Adlard and Charlie Higson on Steel Claw. You've got My Tech the Mighty. You've got Johnny Future. These characters that have, have been in the archive for so long, you know, virtually unused, uh, to be able to breathe new life into them with new creators uh, this special is really something you need to be picking up so head along to 2080.com uh, and uh, make sure you reserve your copy as i said we'll be back in a couple of days um still difficult times uh, a lot of stress out there um a lot of people shouting and whatnot so i really hope you're staying well earthlets thank you for tuning in we really appreciate it we hope that the thrillcast is giving you a little bit of thrill power distraction during these dark days so stay safe look after one another and until next time it's blending birthrig alert 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.